Date point. Tenth year. Fourth month. Second week. Second day. A.V. H.M.S. Shaman. H.M.N.B. Folkfer. Folkfer. Simbreen. The Far Reaches. Martina Kovac. Ow, 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 ow! And hold. Fuck! Ah! There you go. Ares released the firm pressure he'd been applying, and Martina sucked in her breath. You okay? He asked. I was right, this is fucking weird, Martina declared over her shoulder, before adding, and painful! Almost as an afterthought. Do I gotta remind you again that your job involves measuring dicks? Ugh, you keep bringing that up, she grumbled. Yes, that's weird too. I've just gotten used to it, okay? Well, get used to this. Come on, I let you keep your underwear on, didn't I? Believe me, this'll go easier without. Martina huffed and put her head down on her folded arms. There had been a lot of midnight fantasies since she'd first met him that involved Ares. Therapeutic massage was proving to be a painfully effective antidote to all of them, which just wasn't fair. She gritted her teeth as he repeated that same press and stretch manoeuvre on another deep knot of tense and damaged gluteal tissue. The deep muscular pain gave way to an intense surface stinging as he stretched the heat tightened skin as well, working on the patch that was threatening to scar. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, fuck! He cleared his throat. Sorry, seriously though, this ain't all down to your injury. Your fascia are fucked. Do you even know how to stretch properly when you exercise? Oh god, you're going to show me, aren't you? Fitness and nutrition is my job, remember? Ares reminded her. He started massaging her obliques. If I was using the suit wrong, you'd correct me, right? Right, right. For whatever reason, the pressure and stretching of her obliques was easier to handle. Then again, she probably hadn't spent most of the last week with them permanently tensed, unlike most of the other muscles in her back. I'm using my body wrong, huh? Let me guess, you start off with your jog first and think like, yeah, this will be up fine, am I right? He was completely right. Yeah. Wrong. You've got to stretch out. He shifted to a lats, which drew an immediate involuntary noise of complaint out of her. Damn, were you just tensed up the whole time? I was in a lot of pain, okay? Martina defended herself. He pushed the breath out of her by applying some unrelentingly firm pressure. When he stopped, she hissed her breath back in through her teeth. Ow. You're doing great, he reassured her. Gotta represent for the tech team. Doing good so far, he repeated. Last time I gave this to one of the lads, he was fucking crying, the big baby. To everyone, and in honour of Major Powell's term for them, the saw operators were universally known as the lads, even among themselves. It sounded a bit strange in any kind of an American accent, but it was just part of the saw culture nowadays. Oh? Details? Forget it. Broco says no, and so does medical confidentiality. Damn it, she sighed, grimacing as he smoothed out another deep imperfection in her musculature. So is this pro code written down anywhere, or...? Sure. In a book of steel, twenty feet tall, hidden in a mountain temple. To even read it, you've got to pass the twelve trials of manliness. Amused, Martina rolled her eyes. Keep your head when all about you are losing theirs, and... Ow! Sorry. And blaming it on you, that kind of thing? I was thinking more like, you know, punching bears, cutting down trees, stuff like that. Was that a quote? Martina found her laugh. With all his technical talk of fascia and his obvious aptitude and intelligence for sports medicine, it was sometimes easy to forget that Ares was, in other ways, quite uneducated. Rudyard Kipling, you really don't know it. Should I? My dad said it's... She had to stop as he did something agonising to her shoulder. Ah, fuck! What was that? Your intraspinatus muscle. What'd your dad say? Right, uh, ow. He said, um... 
He said Kipling's popular among combat arms. I figured you'd know that. I didn't know that. It's more of an army thing, I guess. Daddy was a ranger, she sighed, and rode the next discomfort with little more than squeezing her eyes shut for a second. I don't know how he's going to react when I write him and say, Guess what, Daddy? I got my butt scorched in space. And you're back. Dude, the... Oof. The pony's more important. No argument here. She laughed, and he pushed through his final ministrations to her left shoulder. Okay, he declared. That's it for this session. Next one should be easier. He handed her a bathrobe and turned around as she stood up. She shimmered on the spot, feeling oddly limber and loose, and noted that her healing burn hurt noticeably less from the motion too. It wasn't perfect. She was still feeling sore and bruised from the firm therapy, and frankly exhausted to go with it, as if she'd just got around in the boxing ring. But she felt hugely improved. Wow! Ares beamed his patented goofy smile and bounced slightly in place. She'd always liked that about him. That despite everything that had happened to him, and despite his sheer physicality and all the testosterone that must come with it, he was the guy on the team who smiled the most often and who came with the most inexhaustible store of puppyish energy. Okay, so what's next, Dr. Ares? Warm bath, plenty of fluids and protein, he replied promptly. And you'll limber up properly last thing before going to bed and first thing in the morning. Will do. Are we doing this again tomorrow? Only I have to go stand in front of the old man tomorrow. Oh man, really? You don't deserve that. She laughed. Relax. I gave Davison my crew knowing I was going to get in trouble for it. I'll take my lumps, whatever they are. I hope it goes easy on you. Ares, Major Powell's the best commander I ever had. Whatever he decides I deserve, that's what I deserve. Don't worry so much. Day point. Tenth year. Fourth month. Second week. Second day, A.V. War Platform Lifebringer. Perfection System. The Core Worlds. Grand Fleetmaster. The first thing that struck Tukov about the human fleet's deployment was its position and expertise. Their Fleetmaster clearly had an outstanding grasp of operations and tactics, was well versed in three dimensional thinking, and had a cadre of shipmasters reporting to him, each of whom seemed to have similar insight and competence. Considering how small the human fleet was, it was doing an admirable job of providing near-perfect orbital coverage, especially over the major population centres. Knowing what he did of human space combat doctrine, thanks to the records from Capital Station, Garden, and the recent skirmish in this very system, he was prepared to call it masterful. Which was why he was determined that this was going to be a cordial and non-violent encounter. The presumably late former fleet master Zook, of Perfection System Defense Fleet, had found himself pushed into a prestigious career dead end precisely because of his fatal tendency to focus on the problem directly in front of him, and frankly because of his bigotry. Tukov prided himself on having avoided those pitfalls. Slow the fleet to one quarter light speed and hail the humans, he ordered. The fleet responded like the well-oiled, battle-hardened machine it was. Years of sporadic clashes along the Celsi borders had kept them tough and lean, and full of only the best officers and crew. None of the bickering political dolls who got sidelined into system defence. This was a Dominion war group, the very best. His orders were obeyed smoothly and precisely. Channel open, Fleet Master. Tukov nodded to the comms officer and spoke aloud. This is Grand Fleet Master Tukov Agrar, aboard the war platform Lifebringer. Our fleet wishes to approach peacefully. The reply was a handful of re incoming. When it did, and he laid eyes on his human opposite number, he was struck by the impression both of age and wariness that the Death Order was giving off. Tukov had educated himself extensively on their species, and was quite sure that the human was either unwell or exhausted. Most likely the latter, 
if this was the same Corathus who had so badly confounded Zook. And he could hardly blame the Death Order for physical and emotional fatigue. The man must be feeling a weight of responsibility for what the Hunters had done to perfection. Fleet Master William Corophus aboard the destroyer Violent, he replied, confirming Tukov's suspicions. A few of the Lifebringer's officers exchanged nervous looks, and Tukov could hardly blame them. Destroyer? Violent? Neither the classification nor name were calculated to inspire confidence in the peacefulness of Death Orders. Bellicose names, Fleet Master, Tukov observed. I hope they are not a statement of intent. Only towards our enemies, Fleet Master, Corophus replied. I very much hope we don't count you among them. You do not, Tukov assured him. As Grand Fleet Master of the Dominion Fifth Grand Fleet, I thank you for your defence of this, our planet, in its time of need. And my fleet stands ready to relieve yours of your vigil. Will you withdraw? We shall, Corophus replied. Though he did not know the words and etiquette, his politeness and formality were obvious. He turned to somebody out of his camera's field of view and nodded. The humans must already have planned for this eventuality, because their fleet smoothly climbed to high orbit and walked as one to the orbit of perfection's smallest moon. Tukov wondered whether his own veteran commanders could have executed the manoeuvre so professionally. Considering how short a time humans had been a spacefaring species, their competence was faintly disquieting. He could see why Zook had panicked. Transports to enter low orbit and begin the aid drops, he ordered. Military vessels to take higher orbit and provide coverage. He admitted an expression of satisfaction to himself, as his ships matched the humans for precision and finesse. He was determined to be peaceful and constructive, but there was no reason to show the Dominion at anything less than its best. Indeed, the Dominion's best was exactly what these Death Orders needed to see right now. He transferred the channel to his desk, at the back of the command deck, so as to continue the conversation with a little more privacy and discretion. As one fleet master to another, he said, once settled, I would appreciate hearing your version of events, rather than relying purely on the sensor data. I'm given to understand that the system defence fleet was neutralised by you. Contextual information on the screen attempted to analyse Korofa's expressions and body language as he composed his reply. They settled on a decision that the human was emoting awkwardness and no small degree of remorse. I won't deny it as a matter of historical fact that their senses were disabled at my order, he ventured. Was that necessary? Tukov asked. I deemed it so at the time. And now? Korofas glanced outside his camera's FOV again. Tukov could only guess what he was looking at. After a few long re, the human spoke again, choosing his words with care. I feel a great sadness and sympathy that this attack has happened, Fleetmaster, he said at last. But I can't and won't accept responsibility for it. In the circumstances, I think our decisions and actions were warranted, proportionate and reasonable. Tukov examined the preliminary estimates flowing in from the aid and rescue ships. The early estimates suggest that the hunters may have killed more than a million people, Fleetmaster, he pointed out, and abducted who knows how many. I'm aware, Corfus replied. On Tukov's screen, the contextual information tentatively hazarded a cocktail of sorrow and determination, though the probabilities were low. Humans had such expressive faces that the software's second best guess was a blend of anger and remorse. The differences, it seemed, were measured in millimetre variations in the precise tension of dozens of different muscles. They were able to do so because, on your orders, the system defence fleet was crippled and defenceless, Tukov continued. Yes, to protect a single ship. Yes. And you believe that this was warranted, proportionate and reasonable, Fleet Master? Korofer sat back in his seat. The translator gave up on trying to read his expression. In the circumstances, he stressed, with the knowledge available to me at the time I made the decision, yes. 
This event is going to harm your species, you know, Tugger pointed out. Thank you for the warning, Fleet Master, Korofus replied. But from one commander to another, as equals who should be allies against our mutual enemies, I must ask what you would do if your species was threatened with extinction. What price would you be willing to pay? Tukov did not reply. Instead, he ran a hand thoughtfully down the length of his nose and nodded. If you are willing to lend your help a while longer, he suggested, we could use an out-system patrol. Your ships have the speed and stealth to perform admirably in that role. Communicate your orders and I will see them done to the best of our ability, Korovus promised. Tukov outlined in brief what role the humans would be performing. To loiter silently in the system's outer icy object halo, and serve as a front line of warning should the hunters return, and to alert the fleet of incoming merchant vessels. Korofas listened earnestly and alertly, only speaking to first clarify and then confirm what he was being asked to do. We'll see to it, he declared once briefed. Thank you. Tukov sketched a gesture of respect and gratitude. And I extend an open invitation for you to inspect my ship once the situation is controlled. Korofas betrayed only a moment of calculation. Thank you, I gratefully accept. Carry out your orders. Aye aye, Fleet Master. The human ships were already aligned and manoeuvring. Tokov had barely closed the line to Violent before they went to warp, displaying an alarming acceleration profile. Tuko's fastest scout ships could only barely have matched them, and he very much doubted that Korofas had shown their full capability. He turned his attention away from them, for now, and toward the surface of perfection. There was a lot to do. Date point. Tenth year, fourth month, second week, third day, AV. HMS Shaman. HMNB Folkfer. Folkfer. Simbreen, The Far Reaches. Major Owen Powell. Cinderin. Considering she was probably still enduring some lingering tenderness from both her injuries and Warhorse's thorough rehabilitative administrations, Kovac wasn't showing an iota of it. She entered Powell's office with parade ground perfection, not a hair out of place, not a ribbon misaligned. Her left face, Attention and salute were all razor sharp. Sir, Technical Sergeant Martina Kovac reports as ordered. Dressings down require power to look for any imperfection, however tiny. Kovac stood rock still and expressionless as he circled slowly around her, looking for the slightest blemish and finding none. That was a relief. He knew in his heart that he'd have done the exact same thing in her situation, and would have hated to make this telling off any more severe than it had to be, especially not over a triviality. She held the salute as he circled her, and only snapped it back down after he had returned to his seat, returned it, and slowly lowered his own hand. Technical Sergeant Korvac, do you know the purpose of this meeting? He asked, lightly. Yes, sir. Normally, Korvac, he said. I expect NCOs to be enforcers of the rules, rather than breakers of them. She knew better than to respond to what had not been a question, so he didn't draw the pause out for long. I will be interested in hearing your explanation. Davison might well have died, sir. I believe that explanation suffices. Kovac was experienced and intelligent. Rather than playing it cagey, she was appealing to an age of reality of war which was that the rules sometimes had to bend, especially in the face of suffering. Truth be told, she was right. The explanation did suffice. Nevertheless... Powell nodded. Certainly from what I gather, he was looking at permanent disfigurement and disability, he said. In light of which your actions are entirely understandable, I might even say commendable. He paused, then delivered the inevitable. However... I must find that they were not acceptable. As NCO in charge of suit systems, one of your principal duties is to ensure that all SOAR personnel, yourself included, are mission ready at all times. 
The use of crude ear is restricted to saw not only for that reason, but also because our supply of it is so limited. We simply do not have enough to administer to every wounded man and woman in all the Allied services who suffers a grievous injury. I know you understand this rationale. Much as I appreciate that it's difficult to be cold when faced with suffering like that, the restriction exists for a reason. Do you understand? Yes, sir. He picked up a folded piece of paper. In light of the circumstances, I have written this letter of counselling, he said, handing it over, which shall be maintained in your regimental records until such time as I see fit to dispose of it. This is not a punishment, but it is a stern warning and it is evidence, which you should not compound with further incidents. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Kovac was good at not giving anything away, but Powell was looking for the very subtlest of tells, and decided that she was receiving exactly what she had known was coming, and was prepared to accept. Read it. She did so, diligently, and signed it after Powell had outlined the assorted legal necessities. Very well. Powell stood, rounded the desk and leaned against it. Just a part in common. And this is more... Informal, he added. Kovac didn't break posture. The ideals of the sore are humility, service and selflessness, he reminded her. Not that he needed to. Everyone in the regiment knew the ideals. Calculated gambles with your career for what you think is a good and justified cause. Well, if, heaven forfend, you should ever find yourself needing to make a similar choice in future... I want you to remember that the regiment needs you, Kovac. We have a lot of talented people here, and they need both your expertise and the example you set. Her composure finally showed a minor flaw. She blinked. Yes, sir. Powell made a satisfied hmm and returned to his chair. Technical Sergeant Martina Kovac, you are dismissed. Martina Kovac. Warhorse was loitering a respectful but nearby distance from the Major's office. She protested that he needn't. He had insisted. How did it go? he asked. Following slightly behind her, given that the base's narrow hallways and his own bulk prohibited side-by-side -side perambulations. I got exactly what was coming to me, Martina told him, allowing herself a satisfied smile. Powell's veiled compliment at the end there had done much to lift her spirits. It was good to know that the old man had disciplined her out of obligation. Like everybody else in the unit, she was slightly in awe of him, and knowing that he was as much on her side as he could be in the circumstances was a real boost. That's good? Adam hazarded. She smiled and nodded. L.O.C. That's still a punishment, Ares pointed out. You've never had one? Not yet. You will, Martina predicted. Everybody gets one sooner or later, and hell, that was nothing. Believe me, it could have been a lot worse. She stopped and turned to him. But you know what? I saved a guy's face and maybe his life. Fucking worth it. Feels good, don't it? Adam agreed. Yep, yeah, just need to heal up and I can call this one a win. Oh yeah, about that, he said. Got a decision for you. Shoot. Okay, so we can keep on with the rehab like we have been, or we could go crew-assisted, he said. It'll go twice as quick, but it'll hurt more. Martina sighed. She was getting kind of sick of pain, which in fact meant that there was no sense in prolonging it. Do you know what body slamming into red-hot metal feels like? She asked. He shook his head. I do. I can handle the crew regime. He grinned. At a girl. Date point. Tenth year. Fourth month. Second week. Third day. A.V. North Clearwater County. Minnesota. USA. Earth. Xu Chang. Allison had a musical laugh. It started deep inside her and bubbled up like water. It was a nice compliment to Julian's filthy, throaty chuckle. Perfect for drawing out of them with campfire stories after sunset. 
Oh my god, really? You couldn't smell it or anything? Xu shrugged with a faintly embarrassed laugh. I didn't know what alcohol smells like. And, uh, yeah, Talamay is, well, actually is about as strong as this beer. She waggled the bottle for emphasis. Beer had come as a surprise. Considering that the only other alcoholic drinks she had to compare it to were red wine and talame. She hadn't expected cold, fizzy and bitter to translate to something she enjoyed, but in fact once she got past that and found the wheaten and even fruity flavours lurking underneath, she'd converted, much to Alison's delight. Julian was poking at the burning wood with a stick, assessing it for when they could put the meat over it. She could see his teeth twinkling in the firelight. How much did you have? Alison asked. Uh... Zhu put her head back and stared at the stars, thinking. It was nice to imagine that one of them was Goyen, even though she knew that particular sun was much too far away to be seen by the naked eye. We got so used to how I drank more water and had a bigger appetite than the mothers that, well, they were drinking shot glass sized measures, and I was having it in more like a highball glass. And Goyens really don't get drunk? Julian asked. No, they just like the taste. How does that work? Julian wondered. It's the same solvent and they're not that biologically different to us. It's got to get into their bloodstream, right? Maybe, I don't know, Drew shrugged. All I know is, they don't get drunk. They were all kinds of surprised when I started giggling and stumbling around and then fell asleep. Alison made a shrunk sound and aborted the swig she'd about to take of her own beer. You're a lot of fun when you're drunk, though, she noted. I'm fun when I'm sober, too, Zhu objected. And even more fun when you're drunk, Alison nodded. Her grin broadcast pure teasing. Zhu shot her remock bitchy pout, which Alison returned and they spent a few seconds pulling increasingly silly faces at each other, before Zhu pulled out a trick she hadn't done since she was a little girl, and touched the tip of her nose with her tongue while squinting. Whatever the subconscious rules of their completely impromptu game were, she considered it a win when Alison's sputter and laugh ruined her next attempt. Penalty, finish your drink, she ordered her. Ah, oh, yes ma'am. Good girl. Zhu loved that little back and forth. Out of solidarity, she finished her bottle, along with Alison. More? Julian offered. He reached to his right and knocked on the corner full of ice water and beer bottles. Alison shuffled up next to Zhu. I think he's trying to ply us with drink, she observed. I think he is, Zhu agreed. I say we let him. Yeah? Yeah. Well, all right. Play away, Esther City. Yes, ma'am. Zhu smiled to herself as he selected two fresh cold bottles from the cooler and accepted the good boy this earned him with a quiet smile. Apparently happy that they were ready to cook, he also grabbed the Tupperware with its garlic and lemon chicken breasts and flipped them onto the metal grill where they hissed and steamed beautifully. I'm going to miss this, Zhu decided, looking around. Once upon a time, she would have thought that being in the woods after sundown, surrounded by trees and animal noises, would have been terrifying. Instead, the house and property that Julian had inherited from his grandfather felt cosy, in the little stain of firelight. I love it here. We've got another week before we have to leave, babe, Alison told her. And you get to fly a spaceship, Julian pointed out. I love this place too, but come on, tell me you aren't excited. A little bit, Zhu admitted, taking refuge in massive understatement. She'd found time to call home and talk to her parents during the week, and had found it easier with some distance, and with Julian and Alison there for support. Hearing the envy in her brother Wei's voice had been delicious, which was so wrong of her, but still. Liar, Alison accused fondly. You can't wait. Okay, okay, sorry, Zhu laughed. You're right. What's there left to do, anyway? Alison asked. Nothing, Julian replied. All the jobs are done. We've got a week to relax and be free. So that's why you suddenly decided to celebrate. Alison snapped her fingers. Should have guessed. So, um, 
What are we going to do for that week? Zhu asked. It was dawning on her that her life had been so driven by objectives over the last several years, that suddenly having nothing to do was actually a daunting and alarming prospect. Uh, Julian hesitated. Actually, I don't know. They looked at Allison, whose expression was suddenly that of a woodland creature staring at the lights of a speeding truck. Uh, we could... They sat in mutual awkward cluelessness for about ten seconds, before Julian finally laughed. Seriously, do we... Do none of us know how to just take a load off? I guess not, Jules said. Hey, we do, Alison disagreed. Movie nights? Every day for a week, Julian asked. That much Disney might kill a man. You like Disney? Alison frowned at him. Ever heard of too much of a good thing? Well, okay, mister, Ju challenged him. Come up with an idea. Julian turned the chicken over, thoughtfully. Actually, I always wanted to see Yosemite. The National Park? Allison asked. Julian laughed. No, the cartoon cowboy, he snarked. Allison rolled her eyes and flipped in the bird with a wary expression, so he leaned over and gave her a kiss. How about it? Quick road trip? Visit some places we've always kind of wanted to? He looked at Zhu. What do you think? Zhu blinked, desperately trying to think of somewhere she wanted to go. Her parents had always talked about visiting the old country, despite both of them having been born in Canada. But she says that maybe places outside of North America weren't an option. She selected the first thing that came to mind. Um, I don't know. Vegas? Okay. That's not too far from Yosemite either, Julian nodded. Al? Alison tucked her phone out of her pocket, and for the 50th time, she reminded herself to inquire just where the hell she found jeans with useful pockets. Sec. Julian and Ju traded a confused frown as she googled something. Al? It's Memorial Day this week, right? Which means... Alison lowered her phone, grinning hugely. The Carnival San Francisco is this week. That sounds pretty easy. Fly to Vegas, stay on the strip, rent a car and drive to Yosemite, then to San Fran, return the car there and fly to Omaha. Can we afford that? Ju asked. Julian and I got paid by the abductee repatriation program for the work we did on Kirk's ship, Allison explained. We can afford it. Julian turned the chicken over again. Hell, if all this legal shit wasn't fretting the house, we wouldn't need to take the Byron contract. I mean, I still want to, he added, before Alison could say anything. But we wouldn't need to. Shu looked back at the house. So we fixed it up and now we're just... going away? We can enjoy the fruits of our labours for a day or two, Alison assured her. But I like this road trip idea. We were gone for so long and we'll be leaving again. I think we should at least try to... Um... Reconnect? Julian suggested. Yeah, Alison nodded. Zhu's own attempts at reconnecting had been disastrous. Her old friends had all shown up with an assortment of hugs, chocolates, cards, and a beautiful red leather phone case decorated with a hand-painted golden heron from her best school friend. She probably not heard from any of them again after that. Zhu Chang, living ghost, Remembered fondly, but everyone had already mourned her and moved on. Having her pop up alive again, ten years later, and five years too young, thanks to the effects of stasis, it had been too awkward for everybody involved. She decided not to mention her doubts that any of them could really connect any longer. Alison was far too headstrong to be gracefully talked out of something she was enthusiastic for, and in his own quiet way, Julian was even more tenacious still. Besides, Zhu was self-aware enough to know that she was a natural introvert, and she was feeling the familiar inertia of all introverts being pulled on by a more extroverted personality, like Alison. It was counterbalanced by the knowledge that Al was entirely correct, and that she would enjoy herself, if only she allowed herself to be led. Fine. Fine, she smiled. 
Let's do it. Julian turned the chicken over, then clicked his tongue irritably. Forgot the plates. I'll get them. Alison sprang to her feet and headed back indoors. Is ready? Ju asked. She crawled forward to get a closer look. That was fast. Not yet, Julian said. It's, uh, gonna need a while longer yet. Smells delicious. Ju turned toward him and Sally became aware of just how close they'd unconsciously gotten. Um... There was a long, hopeful moment where every detail became crystal clear. The way his breath was shaky in the inhale, and he didn't exhale at all. The supple play of the muscles in his throat. The way his mouth opened slightly. The way she could see, up close, that he was longingly watching her lips. Her own expression was probably a perfect mirror image of his. He turned his head, slightly, called, Al? And the moment fell apart. Not for the first time, Zhu sat back and tried not to resent Ellison for her ask first policy. Julian sagged, sighed out his caught breath and cleared his throat. Allison's voice floated out of the kitchen window. Yeah? Never mind. What? Never mind. Okay. Julian sighed and, for something to do, he flipped the meat again. Damn it. Zhu self-consciously tidied some hair out of her face. Um, are we? She began. Julian smiled for her. I'll talk with her, he promised. I just... He raised his hand to gesticulate something. But whatever idea he'd been about to express, the words clearly eluded him. Somehow, though, Zhu knew exactly what he meant. She would have replied, said something except that Alison chose that moment to push the screen door open with her butt, and emerged from the house carrying plates and cutlery in one hand, and a bowl of mixed salad in the other. So, she said, without preamble and apparently too eager to start planning their trip to notice Jules and Julian's awkwardness. Vegas, huh? Jew looked to Julian, who sniffed a silent laugh, smiled, shook his head and returned to tending the meat. Yeah, she said. I had this dream one time. Date point. Tenth year. Fourth month. Second week. Third day. AV. Starship. Negotiable curiosity. Simbreen system. The far reaches. Bedu. What surprised Bedu was how businesslike the humans were, despite their considerable discomfort. They were all complaining and groaning now, but the moment the word arrived to stand up and prepare for boarding, they had immediately laid out their equipment neatly in plain sight, and had then stood against the wall of the ship's common area, while the ship came to a relative halt and prepared to be boarded. When the unmistakable sound of the airlock cycling began, they turned, pressed their hands to the wall above their heads and waited. Bedu was at a loss as to why, but his speculation was soon answered when, once the lock cycled, Five more humans in that thick space armor of theirs bustled efficiently onto his ship. In any other situation, he might have used the term brandishing their weapons, but in fact they were far too clinical and workmanlike for that word to apply. Those guns were being held in the tight, snappy grip of elites who knew exactly how to use them, and who didn't need to wave them around to draw attention to the possibility of future violence. There was a short... Tense and efficient interlude as each of his captors' heads were subjected to a scan of some kind. Only once all four had been pronounced green, whatever that meant, did they relax. The weapons were put away, the body language changed, smiles and hugs and alarmingly physical gestures of affection were roundly shared. In that second, they went from utterly professional killing machines to the very best of friends, reunited and excited about it. One of them remained aloof from the cycle of affection. Not that he was standoffish. Quite the reverse. He welcomed Rebar, Titan, Snapfire and Starfall with obvious affection. But it was more... Detached affection. The court he had no words for, fatherly or brotherly. 
Benu soon found himself under the taciturn care of one of the smaller humans, referred to by the others as Highland. Two others, both of whom were behemothic slabs of muscle, laden with an alarming amount of equipment, seemed to be the medical experts, and they rushed to attend to their exhausted comrades. Beru could understand why. Over the course of what they called a week, those four men had gone from being imposing forces of physical force, to groaning statues who barely moved except when compelled to, by need of nutrition or duty change. Their predicament was an effective antidote to any notion that humans were invincible. Greatly more durable than anybody else could ever hope to be, yes, but Bedu had spent a week watching them slowly fight a losing battle with their own equipment. They were people to him now, nice people even. Courteous, clever, conscientious people whom he was forced to watch suffer. Even for Corti that was an uncomfortable situation. The slightly aloof one, whom he took to be the leader, approached him once things had settled down. He was among the smallest of them, but still easily outmassed Bedu several times over. Bedu? he asked. Yes. The leader nodded. My name's Stainless. You've been detained for questioning as a witness in a matter pertaining to the freedom and security of the peoples of Earth and Simbreen, and of all humans, he announced formally. Sorry for the inconvenience. As it happens, I rather enjoy the inconvenience, Bedu stood. Besides, this attention is legal, so long as you reimburse me for my time. That wouldn't be my responsibility, Stainless informed him, but everything should be above board and legal, yes. Excellent. Are your subordinates going to be well? They seem to have suffered rather badly during the flight. Stainless glanced over at his men. They'll be fine, he said. Thank you for your concern. So what happens now? Bedu asked. There was a lurch, and the ship chimed its usual alert sound for accelerating into a re-entry. Bedu inclined his head. The planet Simbreen, I presume. That's right, Stainless nodded. He exchanged a few quiet words with Titan that Bedu didn't catch, and gave the presumably younger man a pat on the shoulder as he staggered and groaned his way forward to help with the re-entry. Bedu excused himself and took inventory of his belongings, making sure they were all put away and that he had memorised their exact position. He doubted that he would come back to find anything missing, but it would at least be nice to know if they had been moved or searched. The landing wasn't as smooth as Mumruk would have managed, but it was by no means a bad one. In fact, humans being the high gravity species they were, and capable of handling really quite serious jolts, they probably felt it was perfectly smooth. Through the wall, Bedu heard Hoosfuk bleat an alarm. Snapfire called something comforting along the lines of, It's okay buddy, we just landed. And Hoosfuk's panic noises immediately ceased. Rebar, Titan, Snapfire and Starfall disembarked first, though Starfall was leaning heavily on the largest of his comrades, and Snapfire had to be carried, slung across the shoulders of the second largest, whose careful footfall still made the deck plating groan and protest. Bedu watched with mingled awe and disbelief. Snapfire had struck him as being so heavy that even medium Steve Dor drones would have struggled with his mass. While the feat certainly didn't look effortless for his comrade, Nana did it look like he was pushing his limits. Bedu and Hoosfuk were carefully shepherded down the ramp by Stainless, Highland and one of the large ones, whose moniker Bedu had not learned. They were met at the bottom by a consignment of humans, not wearing armoured pressure suits, but instead clad in looser and clearly more comfortable working garments. These were still armed, a ludicrous consideration given that either one of them was comfortably strong enough to dismember anybody who wasn't human, but the weapons were small and holstered. This way please, one of them said, waving his hand toward a nearby vehicle. Closer still, the four aching saw men were being aided onto a transport whose rear step was almost brushing the ground. Bedu looked around. Simbreen was a pleasant planet, but there was something strange about it that he just couldn't quite identify. Maybe it was the humans themselves. Their every movement seemed faintly awkward, as if they weren't quite walking naturally. Of course, they wouldn't be, would they? 
Simbreen's gravity was rather higher than Bedu's native norm, but must be much lower than Earth's. Or maybe it was the auditory landscape. Corti ears were large and sensitive, well adapted to the comparatively low atmospheric density of origin. In Simbreen's denser air, every noise was a little louder, and a little deeper, and they carried distant hints of shouting, construction work, traffic, and alien laughter. Only that last one was an unfamiliar sound, of course, but the cadences and sheer business. Hudsfuck provided the answer. He trudged down the ramp, shying away from the humans, and glancing nervously around as if looking for somewhere to run, but as he always did whenever they landed, he paused and took a deep breath. He promptly buried his nose in his hands, croaking aggravatedly to himself. Hosvuk? Bedu asked. This planet reeks! Hosvuk explained. Corti had very little to speak of in the way of a sense of smell, so Bedu deferred to his crewman's superiority in matters olfactory. In what way? Hosvuk raised his head and his nostrils flared. It smells of predators, he decided. And... Ugh, I don't know what most of these smells are, but I don't like them. That would be it. Weak as corti nasal acuity was, the pheromones and scents on the air would still be present, on a subconscious level, informing his mood. He nodded, satisfied that the mystery was solved. Well, he said, all the more reason to be done with this interview and get on our way. What about our employers? Hosver asked. Corti didn't smile often, but when they did, it was usually because they had scored some small moment of empowerment. Bedu allowed himself an unabashed expression of triumph, and borrowed a human word of unmatched communicative potential. Fuck our employers, he said. Date point. Tenth year. Fourth month. Second week. Third day, A.V. HMS Shaman. HMNB Folkfer, Planet Simbreen, The Far Reaches, Martina Kovac. Anybody who knew the lads knew they weren't superhuman. Absolutely pushing back the limits of what human could mean, yes, but it was difficult to be in awe of somebody when you regularly saw how much pain, inconvenience and indignity they suffered through. Ares had put his finger on it. Martina was a biomechanical expert who had more academic training than most civilian surgeons, and a broad role covering absolutely everything about the life support functionality of every EVMAS they had, including the ones waiting in reserve for qualified operators who could wear them. It fell to her to dig through feedback and medical reports, diagnosing the most minor of concerns with the suit, and liaising with the lads themselves on their own fitness and suit readiness. It fell to her to sign off on every life support pack's fitness for use, and it fell to her to keep the suit techs properly briefed on any concerns that needed addressing. She loved to boast to her friends and family that she was in charge of a whole team of spacesuit experts, but the unglamorous reality was that many of the suit's most important systems were below the waist, and so, as Ares had pointed out, it fell to her on a monthly basis to intimately measure all of the lads, and that was only the most minor of the several vital responsibilities she had that all involved the pelvic anatomy. Put bluntly, she had to think a lot about how much of the guys pissed and shit, both in terms of frequency and in terms of volume. Those inelegant metrics were thoroughly effective at grounding her estimation of them all. It was a bit like knowing the directory of Spider-Man's porn folder, or which was Wonder Woman's preferred brand of tampon. At least her back was almost completely pain-free by now, thanks to some aggressive therapeutic massage and crude treatment. Warhorse had declared that he wasn't going to be able to stop the burn from leaving some permanent scarring, but when she'd examined it over her shoulder in the mirror, she decided that while the white mottling and dimpling down her right flank and buttock weren't pretty, it was still much better than she'd feared. This was good, because today wasn't a day for limping around. At least, not for her. When Vandenberg, Blazinski, Sykes and Akiyama were delivered to the suit shop, they were practically stretched in, and every single one of them was gaunt and pale with fatigue and cramping muscles. 
for a change. Pumping in the ice cold water that was vital to persuading their midsuit layers to relax and shrink so that they could be removed produced no complaint. Getting the suits off was much more difficult than usual because the guys couldn't pull as hard as they normally would, but off they came in the end. In fact, in Titan's case, they only freed him by getting Burgess to help with heaving on him. Ares was too busy lifting Sykes out of his suit and getting an IV into him. Just in case Martina was still harbouring any lingering doubts about how rough the lads really had it, the stench was unbelievable. Bozo, who had been left sitting obediently in the corner, wanted to be introduced to his new friends, promptly sneezed, shook himself and got the hell out of there with his tail between his legs. Martina envied him. Fortunately, she didn't have to deal with actually cleaning the suits. That was for the techs. But body biochemistry was absolutely her concern, so she told her nose to shut the fuck up and gathered what she needed from the suit's sewage processors. Briskly took the needed blood samples and excused herself to the safe atmosphere of the lab. From there, while the samples were spun, had lasers shone through them and all the other assorted work that the testing machines did, she was able to liaise with the protectors and keep them appraised of her results in real time. Between them, they quickly decided that the best thing for their buddies was to get them scrubbed up and bedded down on cots right there in the suit shops, with drips in for hydration and glucose, a maximum dose each of Crew D, and a license to sleep for as long as they needed under supervision. She was grateful to find, once all the results were in and she'd evaluated them, that in her absence, the suit shop had returned to its more usual nasal background noise, which, although it did include a strong note of body odour, at least balanced that note with lubricant, hot rubber, industrial cleaning agents, and solder. Warhorse had taken first shift in supervising his exhausted buddies, who were all fast asleep on cots along the dividing wall, between the shop and the locker room. Out of their suits, they were an obvious mess. All four were sporting pinch marks, blood blisters, bruises, rash, and the other trademark skin discolorations that came with wearing f masks for any length of time. They had a form for recording those. A stylized human body from several angles, with a simple emblem system. Crosses, hashing, plus signs and stars, for recording the location and size of different kinds of marks. He saved her a job there, and began filling them in himself, and they took a moment to double check to her satisfaction that he hadn't missed anything as best they could, without actually moving on or waking the sleepers. How are their results? he asked. Once she had satisfied herself and pocketed them. Nothing scary, but God, I wouldn't want to have metabolite levels that high, Martina said. Sykes especially must be in agony. Horse gave his buddies an unhappy look over and nodded. Both of them caught movement in the corner of their eye, and stood when it turned out to be Major Powell crossing the shop with a serious expression. Not that he usually wore any other kind. Sit down, sit down, he called, waving them down. I'm just checking on them. They'll be fine, sir. Evers and I were just discussing their blood work, Martina told him. Powell nodded. Any thoughts on their recovery time? Horse looked at Martina. Two weeks, two and a half, he asked. That's maybe being optimistic, Martina suggested. The rehab diet alone. Right, yeah, Ares nodded. Just a ballpark will do me for now, Powell said. Three weeks, sir, Martina told him. Powell's jaw worked thoughtfully as he assimilated that news. Callie and Drydock, for the lads convalescing. I've got Jackson wanting to train you and baseball off of PR work. He grumbled, gesturing to Ares. General Trembler is going to have to find somebody else for the embassy job. Never a dull moment, Martina observed. They all knew the subtle ticks and tells that were Powell's expressions, and she saw a silent laugh fall momentarily at the corner of his mouth. Aye, at least I'm not fucking bored, he agreed. Okay, you two bash together a recovery schedule, and I'll let the Navy worry about getting us a replacement rad while ours is in the shop. Yes, sir. Powell left them in peace. Martina started calculating the rehab schedule in her head, 
and Ares was plainly doing something similar, uh, biting his fingers. She tried and failed to stifle her amusement. He was so huge and prestigiously muscled that counting on his fingers made him look adorably chromagon. Even though she knew that he was furiously calculating some quite sophisticated medical realities. He didn't fail to notice and went slightly red. What? Nothing. What? She laughed and pantomimed counting on her fingers while putting the dumbest, most theanderful face she could. He snorted, directed an affectionate middle finger at her, and went back to his mental arithmetic with a smile. Martina pulled her notebook from her pocket, and happily did the same. Apparently the therapy hadn't killed off their chemistry after all. Day point. Tenth year. Fourth month. Second week. Sixth day. AV. Las Vegas. Nevada. USA. Earth. Alison Bueller. Come on, honey, you've got this. First roll. Zhu was plainly having the time of her life. A loud woman with a broad Louisiana accent was cheering her on, and she wasn't the only one. The four other players at the table were all calling words of encouragement. Zhu, meanwhile, was smiling nervously as she picked up the dice. Alison laughed as she and Julian watched her imitate what others had done and blow on the dice in her hand, then cast them vigorously down the table. There were cheers. Everybody collected some chips and Zhu pumped her fist, danced an excited circle on the spot, and eagerly accepted the dice to throw them again, drinking in the words of praise and encouragement from the eclectic mix of people at the table. Do you follow what's going on? Julian asked. She just rolled an 11, Alison explained. That's good. Alison smiled. Everybody's $10 richer thanks to her. <laughs> That's our girl. They watched you share a joke with a lady from Louisiana. It was hard to hear what she said over the sound of people calling for a repeat performance, and bounced the dais off the far wall of the table. This was met with a more subdued response, but still a generally positive one, and several chits were added to the table. It was all clearly a bit arcane for Julian. His attention wandered as the croupier manoeuvred her stick around, and returned the dice for another throw which was met with a more muted response. So I've been thinking, Alison told him. About what? About you and her. Julian turned to face her. You're still okay, right? I'm fine, are you? You've not really, you know, moved things forward. We have our moments, Julian said. It's just tricky. Moments like what? Like little moments, where if I was having the moment with you... He leaned over suddenly and kissed her. Like that, you know. Touched, Alison smiled. So what's tricky about that? Well, you said we have to ask permission first, and... I mean, I don't know how to do that without it kind of... I want things to be natural, Julie explained. You know, spontaneous. Yeah, it's like if we have to ask permission. I get you, Alison nodded. She sat back and watched you throw her dice. Whatever she rolled, it produced a neutral response from her fellow players. She took a swig of her beer to cover a rush of mixed emotions. Julian saw right through her. Are you okay? he asked. I'm... kinda. Alison sighed and started over. I want to just agree that it's a stupid rule, she confessed. I feel like I shouldn't be so insecure, you know. Hey, it's okay, he began reaching out and taking her hand. Alison squeezed his fingers. No, it's not, she interrupted. This whole thing with her was my idea after all. A rule like that is just... It sends mixed signals. I'm not putting my money where my mouth is, you know. It is okay, Julian insisted. We're all in this together. You and me, we don't want to hurt you. And if you need time to adjust to things, then that's fine. There was a chair from the table. Grinning from ear to ear, Zhu cursed it for her fellow players. She saw Alison and Julian watching her, and gave them a huge beaming smile and a wave. You know, I wasn't expecting to enjoy Vegas, Julian confessed, returning the wave. I've been here before, and it's too... 
It's just not my thing. But I love how much she's enjoying herself. Alison nodded. For carriage, she finished her beer. Baby, I don't know if I'm ready to scrap the whole permission thing yet, but the next time you have one of those moments, I want you to promise me you'll go for it, okay? Al, I mean it, mister. You kiss that girl the first chance you get. That's an order. Julian stared at her for a second, but he knew when she was serious. He didn't joke about with a yes man this time. He nodded. I promise. Good. Allison scooted round and cuddled up to his arm. I love you. He kissed her forehead. I love you too, dummy. Ju's run of good luck came to an end with a groan and a short round of applause from everyone else at the table. She said her goodbyes, collected her chips and sprang over to Allison and Julian's table, looking thoroughly pleased with herself. How'd you do? Julian asked her. She had gone to the table with a strict budget of ten ten dollar bets. I'm up twenty dollars. She burgled a sack of twelve chips, thoroughly pleased with herself. Nice. What about you guys? Are you okay? This is the best time I've ever had in Vegas, Julian told her. Allison laughed. Same, she announced, having never been to Vegas before. It's fun watching you play. Zhu grinned at them. Okay, so Charlene, that's the lady in the denim vest. She told me about this stage show she thinks we should go see. And Hank, that's the guy with the belt buckle, he was telling me about this gourmet burger restaurant on the boulevard and... She took Julian's hand and pulled him in the direction of the street, babbling excitedly. Grinning to herself, Alison gathered their belongings and followed. Date point. Tenth year, fourth month, second week, sixth day, AV. Planet Perfection, The Core Worlds. Vagno, The Contact. The early years of Vagno's career had involved teetering on the brink of bankruptcy. Not through any lack of skill or a run of bad luck, but because she had early on calculated that whatever her odds of success in the infobrokering business might be, the most probable failure case was assassination. It was, after all, how she had disposed of her own early rivals. To that end, she had spent nearly all of her profits during those early years on personal protection. From bodyguard drones and the very best personal combat rigs, to the full splendour that was her office. Those Spartan walls and that austere desk hid within them a package of assorted defensive technologies, both physical and electronic that made Vagno about the most securely protected living thing in the known galaxy. Nowadays, keeping it at the very bleeding edge required only a fraction of her assets. Her own sensor network had tracked the Hunter Swarm long before Perfection's defense grid. She had already evicted and kindly warned her client by the time they were entering orbit. When they had launched dozens of objects onto a high-velocity re-entry course, she had been given plenty of warning to activate the very strongest shield she had and retreat into the most secure sanctum below. When one of those weapons, a kinetic impactor of some kind, a simple metal pole 20 times her height and bigger around than she could have wrapped her arms, had smashed into the city deck above her, its destructive power had ripped out the surrounding layers, crushing homes, businesses and lives, and gutting the supports of a major corporate skyscraper, which had not remained vertical for long. Vagno herself had barely felt a tremor throughout the short bombardment. Shortly thereafter, her perimeter defences had sensed hunters picking through the devastation, but not like any hunter she had ever seen before. These were larger, even more nauseating in form than their ordinary kin, and laid in dense, fibrous musculature, that reminded her uncomfortably of the few humans she had dealt with in her career. Three of them had died straying too close to the bunker's perimeter, and they had apparently decided not to waste their time cracking her shell when there was much softer meat to be had. They had ravished the city for nearly a day before Vagno's sensors finally detected the return of the humans and several high-energy flashes in orbit, characteristic of lithium-deutride fusion. 
Rather than fight the hated Death Worlders, the hunters had departed with their holes full of slaves and their bellies full of meat. So many slaves, so much meat. Even Vagno, dispassionate as she was, couldn't help but feel the weight of panic and alarm against the walls of her rational self-control, pressuring her into reconsidering just how valuable humans really were. When she saw what the hunters had done to the crippled system defense fleet, however, she had to sit and meditate long and hard, before finally recovering the rational control necessary to look at things from the human perspective. And the question presented itself, how had the hunters known? It would be a long time indeed before perfection recovered to the point where Wagner would be back to business as usual, and like all courty, she had a burning need to be productive. Her sense of self-esteem would not permit her to take a vacation during the inevitable lull in her business. Not when there was so gnawing a question left unanswered. The raid was too precise in its timing, too flawless in execution, and too large in scale to have happened on the spur of the moment. This wasn't fortune. Somebody had fed perfection to the hunters. Somebody had almost fed Vakno to the hunters. And Vakno had had people killed for much less than that. She started digging. Date point. Tenth year. Fourth month. Third week. First day. AV. Yosemite National Park. California. USA. Earth. Julian Esther City. All of the tourism pictures showed Yosemite on clear blue sky days, when the waters were still and mirror polished, flanked by a stentorian forest bearded honor guard of mountains. Julian thought it looked even more beautiful in the rain. It wasn't serious rain. Really, it was more a kind of acrophobic cloud that processed down from the mountains and dragged a Diaphana's silver wedding train of light drizzle behind it, which fogged out the bombastic landscape that so entranced the documentary makers and tourists, and instead forced the eye to notice the smaller, the closer, and the more immediate things. Allison, naturally, was lurking in their tiny tent, built for two and delightfully cosy for free, under the tarp shelter Julian had rigged up for them, and she was refusing to stray out into the rain. She seemed happy enough to wrap up warm with an e-book and a thermal flask full of overteen and watch him work. And once he was done, she'd insisted that Julian should go commune with nature and not worry about her. Zhu was a complete contrast. She slapped on her outback hat and gone exploring, the second Julian had declared their little day camp complete, apparently oblivious to the chill and the moisture. She'd acknowledged his warning to be careful and not stray too far, they set out eastwards towards the sound of the river, armed only with the backpack of essentials he'd prepared for them all, just in case. Julian took his time in following her. She wasn't hard to follow. The fitness regime she'd followed religiously during her years in exile meant, especially thanks to the weighted clothing she wore to try and simulate the Earth's gravity, that Zhu was a little powerhouse, remarkably strong and heavy for her apparent size, and despite her agility and poise, She'd never learned the art of stepping softly. To an experienced tracker, and Julian was a master tracker, her footsteps were nearly as clear and obvious in the wet ground as if they'd been painted there in blades orange. What she didn't do was make much noise. Julian was the other way around. He stepped lightly and tried to leave no clear sign of his passing, but he did sing to himself, humming and whistling through the bits where he couldn't remember the lyrics. It was maybe a little ridiculous, but if there was anything nearby that would prefer to avoid him, he should give it plenty of notice rather than startling it. Besides, he was so used to doing it by now that it would have felt strange to him not to sing as he walked. Hey, darling, I hope you're good tonight. <laughs> Tell me something sweet. He ambled along in Jew's way inspecting all of the things she'd paused to look at, and several other interesting things that she'd apparently missed. The sedate pace allowed him to satisfy himself that he picked the right spot for them to deli the day away. There was no sign of any potentially dangerous wildlife in the area, which was his biggest concern, 
but also no sign that the river ever got high enough to threaten them or their staff. He lost her trowel when he reached the river, and the ground became nothing but stones and rock, but that hardly mattered, because she hadn't gone any further. Julian hadn't ever got onto the subject of spirituality or religion with Shu. He had no idea what she believed in, but he knew that she meditated every day when she could, usually first thing in the morning before he and Allison were up. The day they'd left Minnesota, she'd woken up extra early and had been seated comfortably on the log by the fire pit, facing the dawn sun when Julian had risen. Now she was seated in the lotus position on a rock by the river. She'd taken her hat off and let her hair down, and had her face turned slightly to the sky with a subtle, liberated smile playing around her lips, enjoying the play of cool moisture over her face. She opened her eyes, and gave him a relaxed smile and a wave. Singing to yourself? she asked. Always a good idea in the woods. Julian shrugged off his pack and sat down next to her. I'm pretty sure there aren't any bears around, but... Her face fell. Oh, wow. Bears? Always possible, but I don't think so. Nothing here they'd want. She gulped and looked around. Maybe I shouldn't have run off alone. Sorry. Julian chuckled. It's okay. If I thought there was any serious danger, I'd have stopped you. Trust me. I do. She would squeeze some water out of her hair, then laugh nervously. But, wow, we really do live in a death world, don't we? Oh yeah, Julian nodded. Kind of smacks you full in the head sometimes, doesn't it? She nodded. Still, it's beautiful. I've always wanted to come here, Julian agreed. Almost gave up on getting the chance, really. Alison's missing it, though. Don't worry, she's perfectly happy, Julian promised. June nodded and looked around again at the iconic landscape. The light rain was almost nothing now, enough to moisten the skin and slowly soak into their clothing, but it was doing nothing to impede the view. In fact, the shreds of clouds garlanding the peak slowly enhanced it. Are you warm enough? Julian asked her. I'm fine, she assured him. This is nice. We're both used to chilly temperatures, huh? She nodded. Gow and spaceships, and I guess this is nothing next to a nightmare winter. Downright warm, and don't forget Canada. She waved a hand dismissively. Vancouver's not that cold. Julian nodded, shut his eyes and let the white noise of nature permeate him. He was used to the wilderness, and had long learned the trick of really turning on his ears. Modern human life meant that people rarely got the chance to understand just how acute their senses truly were. It wasn't that their ears got numb or anything, just that daily life involved being surrounded by so much noise that filtering out everything except for a narrow band of important sounds was an ingrained survival skill. Unlearning that skill and noticing everything that was a real trick. The same went for the nose. Given time to adjust, the human nose could pick up the musk of a mouse in nearby bushes, or the avian funk of a nest full of chicks in the trees above. The ear could tell flycatchers from warblers, and hear stones knocking along the riverbed, if only the listener knew how to listen. He certainly heard Ju's contented sigh, and the way she settled herself a little more comfortably and slowed her breathing. They enjoyed the comfortable silence together, basking in the scent of conifers and petrichor, and Julian only opened his eyes when an unexpected beam of sunlight on his face turned the quiet blackness behind his eyelids red. He raised his hand to squint against it. The weather was rolling in waves down the valley, and the rain would be back soon enough, but just for a few moments the view was clear, open and unimpeded. Aya, she breathed. Yeah. He put his arm round her waist. He half expected her to stiffen or catch her breath, but she did the opposite. She sighed happily and leaned against him, resting her head on his shoulder. Rather than saying anything, Julie made a kind of wordless, gently interrogative sound. She nodded against his shoulder and replied in kind. Not a word, but a kind of a happy chirp or purr. 
He kissed her on the top of her head. With a recurring, hmm? She turned her head slightly, got another kiss, this one on the forehead. And when she raised her face to look at him, Julian took his chance and kissed her properly. Zhu issued a passionate squeak, and purely on instinct she put her hand on the back of his head and straightened up to get a better angle, while her other hand splayed on his chest then gripped his shirt. Junior ran his own hand slowly up her back, while his free hand took its place on her waist. It was Zhu who eventually ended it. When they parted, she gasped and rested her forehead against his, while words quietly bubbled out of her, as if she wasn't entirely in control of them. Oh my god, I needed that. I wanted you to do that for... She stiffened. Wait, you asked Alison, right? Julian smiled, trying to overawe his galloping pulse and project composed happiness. I did, he reassured her. Zhu sighed happily, and this time it was her turn to kiss him. They stayed wrapped up in each other by the river for a good long while, talking quietly, kissing frequently, giggling together and bonding. It finally had to come to an end though when a fat raindrop slapped disgustingly into Julian's ear and he looked to the sky. Okay, that's no drizzle, he decided, indicating an ash grey battalion of clouds that were marching down from the peaks with rancorous intent. Zhu exhaled resignedly and donned her hat, pulling it down snugly around her ears. Cuddling up in the tent with Alison sounds good as well, she suggested. You read my mind. They helped each other put on their backpacks, took a last look at the valley in the knowledge that they'd probably never come there again, and put it behind them hand in hand. Date point. Tenth year. Fourth month. Third week. First day. A.V. H.M.S. Shaman. H.M.N.B. Folkfer. Planets in Breen. The Far Reaches. Admiral Sir Patrick Knight Knight hadn't been involved personally in the interview of their alien detainees, of course. That job had naturally fallen to intelligence, according to whom Bedu had been an absolutely model interviewee. Polite, concise, intelligent enough to recognise that resistance would gain him nothing, and with no particular reason to do so anyway. The summary of his interview made for interesting reading. Bedu's business model, it seemed, was inconveniently discreet, to the point where even Bedu himself didn't know who his clients were, unless they wanted him to. The client, who had set him on the trail of Kirk and the missing starship Sanctuary, had done so anonymously, but with considerable existing knowledge of where to start looking. The search had started at the planet Aru, and this in itself was an education. Night was something of a history buff, and alien history in particular was a field that had begun to fascinate him. There was so impossibly much of it, and the Dominion's historical archives, which humanity notionally had access to, by dint of being an associate Dominion member, even if they were far too large to actually be transmitted to any storage medium on Earth, had much too haphazard a filing system for anything to be known, with any real certainty before the courtier had come along and imposed strict data standards on the whole mess. Aru, however. Aru was previously unknown to him, and was now, in Admiral Knight's opinion, a fascinating jewel of historical interest that his amateur antiquarian's instincts would have dearly loved to get in front of the figurative loop. Why Kirk had gone to Aru was known, thanks to the statements given by the two survivors of his crew, Esther City and Beulah, and the young Miss Chang, whom they had collected from the planet. Why he had lingered after recovering her had been a little fuzzier, but Bedu had shed some light on that mystery. The historic decline and fall of every sapient space hearing power in the galaxy was well documented. Indeed, it was one of the topics of fascinated discussion that entranced amateur xenohistorians on the internet. Not that there were yet such things as professional xenohistorians, in the parlance of whom the phenomenon had been named the Great Filter, a term borrowed from one Robin Hansen, who had coined it in an attempt to solve the so-called Fermi Paradox. The Fermi Paradox was a now extinct problem that had distracted people who were inclined to worry about such things 
with the question of where all the aliens were and why they weren't popping in for a cup of tea and a chat. Given that said question's relevance had faded somewhat in recent years, the Fermi Paradox was now only of interest to historically minded students of science and enthusiasts of the burgeoning field of xenoarchaeology. Aru, being the home planet of a species who were already in the late stages of their terminal decline, and apparently disinterested in doing anything to stop it, was naturally a decent starting point for anybody who wished to understand the nature of the Great Filter, and maybe do something about it. Kirk had lingered there, after collecting his most recent rescue, and then when Bedu had been sent to investigate Sanctuary's disappearance, the negotiable curiosity had not needed to search very long and hard to find a debris field 30 light years away. Bedu's ship, its owner had proudly explained, was equipped with particle detectors, sensitive enough to trace the FTR movement of objects, as small as an escape pod up to 10 years after the fact, assuming the trail wasn't confused by the passage of other ships. Space, however, was so, well, spacious, that really that was a problem that only manifested along major space lanes and near stations. Sanctuary, while not a large ship, had been built with such a convention stretching power output that its trail was the easiest Bedu had ever been called on to follow, and it had led him right to the heart of a tumbling cloud of wreckage. Again, the next part matched with what Esther City, Bueller and Chang had reported. Something with the power output of a dreadnought had intercepted them, and both ships had been destroyed when Sanctuary's mortally wounded pilot, Amir Barmani, had rammed the hostile while the rest of the crew abandoned ship. Bedu had initially followed the escape pod, carrying the three humans. Retracing his steps and picking up the trail of the other, faster lifeboat had eventually led into a system known only by its stellar coordinates. Knight glossed over the string of numbers involved, which described the star's type, age, distance, as a proportion of the galactic radius from Sagittarius A, and its deviation in radiance from the straight line connecting that object to the heart of the Andromeda galaxy. The star in question was a red giant, well past its main sequence and venerably burning through its helium. No temperate planets, one gas giant nearly twice the size of Jupiter, a handful of barren rocks and an acidic hell pit that made Venus look like no more unpleasant than a kitchen full of recently chopped onions in comparison. It would have been a completely unremarkable system, if not for the force field enclosing it, identical to the ones that even now protected Simbrine and Earth, and the crashed Gumvra research station lodged in one of that gas giant's moons, which was in the wrong place to the tune of 30,000 light years and change. From an intelligence perspective, however, by far the most important thing that Bedu was able to tell them was that at no point in its voyage from Sanctuary's wreckage to this question mark of a system had Kirk's lifeboat been intercepted. While Bedu himself was orange, augmented, and possibly a target of interest for hierarchy use, but not yet actually suspected of having been possessed by a hierarchy demon, his story was corroborated by the negotiable curiosity sensor records, which in turn showed no signs of tampering. Taken all together, it was good news, and the report concluded with a recommendation that Kirk's own status be downgraded from orange to yellow. He couldn't be called green until an implant scanner had pinged the inside of his skull, but Intel were at least happy enough to move him a step in that direction. All in all, the report put Sir Patrick in a good mood. He wrote a quick mail for the attention of General Tremblay, rubbed his eyes and then turned his attention to the report in his pile, that he knew was going to deflate that good mood slightly. With a sigh, he started to pore over the most recent analysis of Operation Nova Hound. Date point. Tenth year, fourth month, third week, second day, AV. San Francisco, California, USA, Earth. Zhu Chang. Wow. Yeah. What do you think? Zhu had a hard time choosing the right word in any language. Colourful and flamboyant came to mind, but so was Chinese New Year, and nothing else that presented itself quite made the grade either. It's very... gay, 
she decided. That was the nice thing about English. One word could carry such a huge weight of alternative meanings and context, without going into the simply crazy subtleties of intonation that plays such an important role in Mandarin. Both languages were hideously complex when compared to Gowrie, which was refreshingly direct. Gowrie wasn't unsubtle by any means, but it lacked the impenetrable nuance that allowed her to pun like that, carefully deploying three different meanings at once in the span of a rather simple monosyllable. She could only imagine what the actual gay pride parade next month would look like. It'd presumably make this look conservative and sedate. She'd gone quite rusty in both her human languages, thanks to several years of not using them. And since getting back to Ur, she'd almost exclusively spoken English, much to her mother's frustration. Still, she was finally getting things straight in her head, and didn't so often find herself slipping automatically back into the alien tongue whenever she wasn't concentrating. Together, she and Allison watched a young man dance past wearing a pair of gold lame briefs, bright orange feathers, lipstick, and the kind of muscles that belonged on ancient Greek pottery. Show me what you're working with, baby, Allison Cat called. Somehow, the dancer heard her over the drumming and trumpets. He aimed a buttock at them and smacked it with a grin, before dancing along with the rest of his troupe. Allison gave a delighted laugh, and beamed at the way Zhu was giggling with her. Your turn, she declared, and hoisted Zhu toward the railing. Zhu tried not to imagine what her mother would think, picked another male dancer and cupped her hands. Yao Pigou! Presumably, the dancer didn't speak a word of Mandarin, but he seemed to get the gist of it and posed for her, flexing magnificently. Zhu applauded while Alison blew him a kiss. They retreated from the railing as a more stately group in ornate and huge red ball gowns began to sail regally by, and Alison took Zhu's hand to lead her through the crowd. She was in her element, Zhu decided, being surrounded by noise and vibrancy in colour. Zhu loved to get loud, as an occasional treat, as she was doing right now, but Julian had shrunk into himself and had taken the first excuse he reasonably could to retreat to the relative quiet and calm of a coffee shop. Allison seemed to want to sample everything, and she tested even Zhu's reserves as she led the way from street vendor to street performer, to live musician and back to the barricade to watch more of the parade, then on into the crowd. They got matching henna tattoos, sampled fajita chicken skewers fresh off the grill, danced together to the pounding mix of a street DJ who was blending samba and rasta trash into something new and exciting, and generally got drunk on the sheer weirdness of it all before finally finding themselves sitting down at a bus stop and sharing a bottle of cold water, having summoned Julian to come find them. It was coming up on two in the afternoon, and the parade was drumming and gyrating its way toward winding down. Man, Alison commented, watching two dozen women wearing enough pink sequins and feathers to maybe completely cover three of them, struck past smiling. I think I've seen more ass today than the rest of my life put together. Oh yeah? Zhu nodded, winding her eyes to emphasis. Fun though, right? Zhu looked around. People were drifting away, now that the tail end of the parade had passed them. Back to normalcy, and to lives with decidedly less glitter in them. The afternoon breeze still carried the distant sound of drumming through the dense old grid of buildings, but already the whole thing was starting to feel like a dream. Hundreds, or perhaps thousands of magical people, had danced and swayed and played and sung their way along these roads, and behind them were left the permanent fixtures of dusty concrete and faded paint. It was an oddly familiar sensation. You? Sorry, I just... Yeah, it was fun. Alison knew her too well. But, she asked, Well, look. She waved a hand around. Alison did so, frowning as if wondering what she was getting at. Sure got quiet, she observed, then seemed to get what she was driving at. Actually, wow, that's a heck of a contrast. I was just thinking it feels familiar, Hugh told her. Yeah, is it me or is this place kind of ugly without the parade? She was right. The asphalt looked like it hadn't ever been resurfaced, just patched up as needed. 
Overhead was a tangle of bare, black cabling that didn't seem to have any clear reasoning or logic to it. It wasn't that Mission District looked neglected, it just looked preserved, like a jar of pickled onions. It might still be working and useful, but the crispiness and life was no longer entirely there. Where's Julian? Zhu asked. Alison checked her phone. They were all using a tracking app they'd found that could help them home in on each other by sharing how far away their contacts were and in what direction. He's that way, she pointed. Quarter of a mile. Let's go meet him, Zhu stood up. The sheer mundanity was getting to her. I don't think I like it here. Okay. Alison tapped on a wrap to let Julian know they were going to come to him, then took a hand and they set off walking. They cut across the corner of the parade route, and another facet to the sudden absence of the big, glitzy distraction of the carnival made itself known to Zhu. She spent the whole day holding hands with Alison. Most of the time it had been a simple case of not wanting to lose one another in the crowd, but now that they were walking together more slowly, it dawned on her that there was something different about intertwined fingers and an arm wrapped around her own. She glanced sideways at Alison, who caught the movement in her peripheral vision, turned her head and caught her eye, smiled bashfully, and tied a strand of blonde hair out of her face while squeezing Zhu's hand. That was the thing about Alison. Shu had originally thought of her as the master of fake it till you make it, but that was unfair. Alison didn't do fake, she did determined. Her life doctrine seemed to be keeping her foot down on the accelerator, committing wholly to whatever it was she decided to do, and aiming an angry middle finger at her own comfort zones if they tried to get in the way. It should have been intimidating, or obnoxious. In anybody else, it probably would have been. In Alison. She may have held her own comfort zones in contempt, but she had never once violated Jews, and Zhu knew she'd be genuinely upset if she found she was making either her or Julian uncomfortable. That made all the difference, and so she was able to lead where Zhu might not ordinarily have followed. Like walking down the street in broad daylight, holding hands like girlfriends. Because they were, she supposed. That was the point, wasn't it? Alison had made it plain that she didn't want their relationship to just be that of two good friends who happened to share the same man. And while Zhu might ordinarily have settled for just that, not even Julian quite got her pulse going like Alison did, and she wasn't sure why. Possibly it was the lingering shadow of Taboo, or maybe it was the way she kept breaking through walls she'd never known she'd had, only to find clean waters beyond. Maybe it was the fact that Zhu knew in her bones, and from experience, that she could literally trust Alison with her life. Whenever she flashed back to that horrible moment in Sanctuary, when the hull had ripped apart and the Void had tried to drag her away, the memory that always came with it was that it had been Alison who'd reached out and caught her. It was difficult not to want to follow where somebody who'd literally saved her life was leading. She squeezed back and leaned a little closer. Do you ever feel like an alien? She asked. Yeah, Alison nodded. Like I'm not quite human. Or that they're not quite human. She waved her free hand surreptitiously, indicating a family who are wending their way home. Two bouncing children high on far too much sugar, a harassed mum and a dad whose shoe's sarcastic t-shirt was pulled tight over his bear gut. That's it, yeah, Alison nodded. That's exactly it. I just want to ask them, you know, is this who you want to be? Are you happy? You know? That's not very nice, Alison. But I'm not going to do it, Alison defended herself. Just, you know, I know, she nodded. She was looking at people who had never, never gone hand to hand with a sapient worm in a robot suit. Never hidden in a hunter meat locker. Never come within a whisker of horrible death, not once, but twice. Never seen their innocent protégé. Their sister dying. They had no idea who Trimmin had been, what life was really like. She wondered if they even had dreams any longer, or if those dreams extended beyond a happy family and home. They didn't look happy. Alison squeezed her hand again. I try not to judge, she said, 
But it's hard, ain't it? Why, though? She asked. Why is it hard? They're not doing anything wrong. You're right. They're not doing anything. Al, that's not nice. I know, Alison sighed. Even if I feel the same way, it's not nice. I know. Guilt and uncertainty looked so out of place in Alison that she had no option but to give her hand another reassuring squeeze. But hey, we're doing something, she said. That raised a smile. We are, yeah. I just wish more people could. Could get abducted? She teased. Alison laughed. No, dummy, she exclaimed. Just... I wish more people could see how much bigger they really are. This? She waved a hand, indicating the whole preserved city around them. This isn't who we're meant to be. I swear, there's something in the human soul that just longs for adventure. Nearly getting killed? She suggested. No, like... Watching other people get killed? Shoo. Having to wear a disguise for three years, in case they try and blow you out of the airlock, or in case the hunters come looking for you. Babe? She gave her an apologetic look. I'm sorry, she said. But adventures aren't easy or fun now. You know that. Alison sighed. My abductors were called Trevny and Nuffer, she said. She blinked. Alison hadn't ever told her about her abduction before. They were actually okay for, you know, for kidnappers who saw me as a test subject. I might have been strapped naked to a table, but they weren't cruel. It was all... It was just business, right? No malice. She nodded carefully. Okay. I killed them. I didn't mean to. They just... They picked me up because I had a cold and they wanted to study it and develop a cure. They knew enough about us to know that we pay a lot to cure the common cold. But they weren't careful enough and... She sniffed. They weren't nice people, exactly. But they didn't deserve what it did to them. The last thing Nufo did was he gave me a front line and undid my restraints. I'd have died of thirst strapped to that table if he hadn't. And the people who finally rescued me would have died of... I don't know. Acne or candilla or something? Her fingers twisted painfully between shoes for a moment. I know, babe. I know what an adventure really is. I know it means people who don't deserve it dying in horrible ways, and maybe us too. I know all that, and I still don't think I could ever go back to the quiet life. I... I wouldn't know how to cope. She was sighing with her when they saw Julian come round the corner. The uncomfortable shuffle in his step evaporated on seeing them, and he picked up his pace with a wave, which they returned. Neither would I, she conceded. Date point. Tenth year. Fourth month. Third week. Second day. AV. War platform Lifebringer. Perfection system. The Core Worlds. Grand Fleet Master. The ship class designated as war platforms weren't warships at all, at least not in the sense of a ship that engaged the enemy directly. Even though it was layered in armour, shields and point defence batteries, Lifebringer was a staging and command vessel. It was the mothership of a whole fleet of transports, shuttles, dropships and heavy cargo lifters. It was a flying barracks, a mobile airfield, a cavernous cargo bay and a nexus of computer systems. It was, in short, everything that a fleet needed to go somewhere and do something, and it was verging on being as large as a ship could practically get. At a full gallop, Tukfer would have needed more than two minutes to get from one end to the other, even if there had been a single straight corridor fit for that purpose. The humans, he knew, would be impressed. Fleetmaster Corifer's transport was an unmodified Dominion Standard Shuttle, a flying matte grey brick that made up for, in rugged reliability, what it pathetically lacked in grace and aesthetics. Next to the troop lander, and the two heavy cargo lifters currently squatting in Lifebringer's number one docking bay, it was tiny, and it was still big enough to comfortably carry free young Gunravang. When the humans stepped out of it, it made them seem comically small. The heavy vibrations their feet sent ring through the deck shattered that smallness. He'd recognised Korov easily enough, 
The human fleet master was plainly the oldest of the delegation that had come over. The two at the back looked to be bodyguards or marines. Tukfu was hardly an expert on clothing, the most he wore being saddlebags, holsters and a decorative pendant on his neck to signal his rank, but those two seemed less decorative than the others. Corifers, for his part, looked both austere in his black uniform and splendid thanks to its conservative flourishes of gold and white. The Death Order entourage paused in front of Tukfuk's own welcoming party, and Corifers took one extra pace forward. Permission to come aboard, he stated. Tukfuk's translator interpreted this as a formal request, and possibly a traditional war ceremonial courtesy. Permission granted, he replied, judging this to be the most probable response, given how terse the request had been. Borrowing from some research he'd done on humans, he extended the stronger of his two right hands, trusting the human not to grip with the crushing force that Tukfu knew he was capable of. His trust was rewarded. Korofa's handshake was firm, but no more than that. Thank you for having us, he said. Thank you for coming, Tukfu replied. He indicated his subordinates. This is Subfleet Master Ru and Junior Subfleet Master Numvruv. Captain Manning of HMS Myrmidon and Commander Devonold of HMS Valiant, Corpus replied, then indicated the Marines, Corporal Brewer and Corporal Banks. Well then, if it pleases you to inspect the ship, I thought we might talk, Tugfa replied amicably. Lead on. Vutuk did so, gesturing for the human to walk by his side. I had Lifebringer's dimensions converted into your units, he said. She is slightly more than 400 metres across her widest axis, and mass is approximately 60 million kilograms. That must be pushing the limits of what's physically possible, Corophus observed. Certainly in anything which needs to accelerate like a warship, Tukfuf agreed. There are larger ships, but not many, and they are all painfully slow. The biggest ever built, I believe, was a pleasure barge that could not only afford to spend months transiting between worlds, but actively wanted to, so that their guests would have as much time to spend their money as possible. That ship was more than twice the size of this one. The expressive line of dark fur above Korofa's right eye arched upwards. Was? Indeed. It eventually broke apart under the stresses of its own acceleration. Hmm... We have a similar cautionary anecdote from an ocean-going vessel called the Titanic, Corifus told him. The fastest and largest luxury ship of its day. Too fast, in fact. It struck an iceberg and sank in freezing cold waters more than a hundred years ago. Ice. I was given to understand that yours is a hot planet, Fleetmaster, Tukfo observed. The stories of Earth I have heard mention that the sun can burn you and that you can die of the heat. That's towards the equator. The poles are frozen solid year-round. Both? On the same planet? It's a surprise to us that other worlds are any different, Corifus smiled, though he made the courtesy of not showing his teeth. How are we to know, after all? True. In any case, although Lifebringer can accelerate to meet the minimum demands laid down by Dominion security resolutions for a warship, she is still the slowest in the fleet, substantially slower than your own ships have demonstrated. Our doctrines seem to be quite different, Korofus agreed. Maybe we should compare notes. Maybe we should, Tukfuf agreed. The tour wended slowly around the ship, taking in the huge power plant, powered by the newest generation of directorate-made quantum power stacks, the living quarters, an exercise in awkwardness given the wildly differing proportions and needs of the many species on the crew, the cargo handling bays and their army of drones, and finally the command hub dominated by a two-scale holographic map of the system, labelled in blue, yellow and green. How is the situation below? Korofas asked, once Tukfu had demonstrated the map's functionality, by zooming in on perfection itself. The working crew around them went quite still, and listened. Tukfu knew that many of them were firmly of the opinion that the humans were responsible for all the death and destruction not only on perfection, but at Capital Station. Tukfuf couldn't have disagreed more strongly. He had specifically requested this relief effort because, unlike most of his peers, he very much did not view the Hunters as a kind of natural disaster. They were a sapient species, 
entirely in control of their own actions, and the humans seemed to be the only ones who were scoring off to them. That made the Death Order's allies, in his book, and perfection represented an opportunity to make or break their relationship. The Hunters launched hundreds of kinetic weapons from orbit, he said. Perfection's defense system stopped all but 13 of them. The same kind of kinetic weapons that you dropped on Planet Garden, Numvuf observed acidly. Tupfuf ground his molars together. He would have given much not to have the junior subfleet master present for this. Korofus proved equal to the accusation. He looked Numvruv in the eye in that unnervingly level way that humans did and spoke softly and firmly, though with no trace of disrespect. The hunters are dangerous, he agreed, and sadistic and cunning. They're deliberately using our tactics and tools because they want to divide and weaken us. Just as you weaken the defense fleet, Numvruv pressed. That will be all, junior subfleet master, Tukvruv told him, judging that his Kumvu subordinate had gone too far with that remark. Return to your duties. Yes, Grand Fleet Master. The humans cleared their throats and looked awkwardly at one another, as Numvruv gestured grudging respect and stalked up to the command hub. Tukvruv raised his voice just enough for the other crew to hear, though he addressed the humans specifically. I am sorry, he said. We have all seen terrible things with this operation, and it is difficult to remain objective. Korofus caught on to what he was doing and joined in. I sympathise, he declared, and I'd like to thank you personally, Grand Fleet Master, for setting an example and proving that our relationship doesn't need to be antagonistic. We certainly don't want it to be. Nor should we, Tufuf announced, taking note of which of his officers looked away, and which wore body language and expressions of agreement and resolve. I have spent my life fighting the Hunters, and for the first time I am seeing signs of weakness from them. As you said, they are trying to divide us, and I do not think they would even care to try unless they were scared of what we could achieve together. Korovas glanced at Manning and Devonald. Inexperienced as Tukvuf was in reading human facial expressions, there was something inspiring in the way they all shared the same intense smile. In that case, Grand Fleet Master, Korovas extended his hand, I look forward to scaring them some more. Tukfu shook hands with him for the second time. Well said. Date point. Tenth year. Fourth month. Third week. Third day, AV. Celsius Alliance Embassy Station. Earth, Luna, L3 point, Sol. Riley Jackson. Salesy Diplomatic Station, this is Firebird 1, escorting Diplomatic Shuttle, requesting permission to land. Colonel Stewart will be doing the exact same thing over at the Dominion Station, at Earth Luna L1. The timing was important. Both of the major interstellar powers needed to be carefully removed from Sol, and they needed to be removed in such a way as to not escalate the tensions between them, by making it seem like humanity was siding with either one. The shuttle for marines were there in case the hierarchy had an agent on board, who tried something last dish like deorbiting the station or whatever. Permission granted, Firebird One. Welcome back, Major Jackson. You and the shuttle are cleared to land together in Base Seven. She recognized the translated simulation of a voice from her previous visits to the Celsius station. PR being such a big part of Riley's job meant regular smooching with both sides. That was why she'd been chosen to lead this op. The embassy knew her. Plus, if the need arose, her WSO, Joe Semenza, could nuke the station to molten debris. There was something satisfying about having that kind of gratuitous firepower at their fingertips. They made their entrance with all the style and grace that her professional pride demanded, sliding smoothly into the bay on manual, and kissing the deck with nary a bump. Her new sled... A replacement for the one lost in Garden was called Phoenix, and for once Riley didn't fully cycle her down. There was a non-zero chance, after all, that they'd have to make a hasty departure, and Phoenix wouldn't lose too much of her capacitor's stored energy from sitting idle on the deck for a few hours. The Marines, she had to admit, made an even better entrance. The instant their shuttle's ramp clanged down, two dozen of them in full mop marched down it like they were on parade. 
The two Celsi guards who had entered the hangar to greet her were probably shooting nervous glances at each other, though it was hard to tell with Celsi. They looked like a kind of moss grey collision between a monkey, a kangaroo and a lizard, and their oddly shaped skulls with their many eyes gave them fully overlapping 360 degree vision. They didn't need to turn their heads to look at each other. Riley left Semenza to look after Phoenix and approached the two aliens, carefully not removing her flight suit, though she did slide up her glare visor so that they could see her face. She probably looked quite an intimidating sight herself, in her astronaut Snoopy cap, and in the new flight suit that had been adapted from FMAS technology. Is something wrong, Major? One of the aliens asked. She internally kicked herself for not being able to tell Celsi apart on sight. Oh well, time to play it in personal rather than friendly. Call the ambassadors, she ordered. Something important has come up that needs their immediate attention. She wasn't left waiting long. Stationwide announcements in a variety of alien languages rang through the decks, and within minutes she was being escorted, along with the marines, to the forum chamber on the station's topmost deck. She was met off the elevator by Ambassador Sandeep Verma. Verma's career had been an interesting one. Taken in from his native Gujarat to the Indian consulate in Canberra, and ultimately into space to be humanity's ambassador to the Celsi Alliance. Riley had worked with him several times. Something about being the FTL test pilot kept her snowed under with invitations to assorted diplomatic parties, hence why one of her AFSCs was public affairs. She could definitely sympathise with the ambassador's crowded and storied career. That same prestige was what had sent her on this mission. It was important not to snub either side or to show favourites, so while the Dominion got the senior officer in the form of Colonel Stewart, the Alliance got the more notorious one in the form of Major Jackson. They tossed a coin over it. Major? Verma had a smile on, but his body language was wary. Riley shook his hand. Really, she shouldn't waste time with preamble, but the Ambassador didn't need rushing. Can we talk privately? She asked, as she handed him the sealed letter marked eyes only for his attention. It was an uninteresting grey and bore the emblem of the Global Representative Assembly. A circle, two short arc sections sharing the same centre, a longer one, and finally a short one again. Verma nodded and pulled a device from his pocket. A privacy force filled fuzz and opaque the air around them. He ripped the seal on the letter and read it. Short version, big hotel is gone, Riley informed him. The ambassadors, by necessity were both briefed on Deep Relic. Earth Secure and the GRA wants the embassies relocated to Simbreen 5, just to be absolutely certain. Verma grimaced slightly, but nodded as he read the letter. It was much longer than Riley's summary, but probably contained about the same amount of useful information. They are not going to like that, he observed. The ear to being kicked out as well, Riley explained, so neither side gets to claim we're siding with the other. They still will not like it. They can dislike it all they want. One way or the other, this station ain't going to be here much longer, Riley said, dismissively. They're being relocated. They can go amicably and relocate the Simbreen, or they can be expelled, with extreme prejudice. Verma met her eye, then nodded and turned the page, read the name and signature that occupied the top two inches of an otherwise empty sheet, a classic and typical waste of paper, in Riley's opinion, then handed the letter back to her. I shall do my job then, he promised. Good, Riley smiled for him, radiating absolute faith in his abilities. Let us know if we need to get you off the station. These guys aren't just pretending to be marines. Not necessary, Verma smiled, I hope. Thank you anyway. He turned off the privacy field and gestured invitingly for Riley and the Marines to follow him. He swept into the forum with an impressive impromptu air of gravitas, looking thoroughly out of place and vulnerable, next to a woman in a lightly armoured spacesuit and a dozen men in mop. Riley lowered her visor again. The odd thing was that she probably cut the most threatening and alien figure among them. Mop, mission-oriented protective posture, made the Marines faceless and scary 
but the technology hadn't changed much in 20 years, meaning that the men wearing it looked huge and encumbered, but also embarrassingly low tech. It was a good show of strength, but Riley knew from experience that while aliens were often impressed by seeing humans carry heavy loads, there was something they found even more intimidating about the human body itself. The shape of it. The way they moved. For whatever reason, aliens saw the same thing in a walking human that humans saw in a stalking tiger. Mop hid that. Riley's flight suit didn't. It was built by CNM spacesuit systems, using the technology they developed for Evmas, making it snug, sleek and technical. A far cry from the bulky thing she'd worn eight years ago in Pandora's early flights, with its duct tape modifications and velcro patch inside the helmet for scratching her nose. Riley secretly geeked out about it all the time. It looked like it had been created by the better class of digital artists, the ones who managed to balance a high-tech aesthetic with actual military function and practicality. In the circumstances, it was not only a good way to show off that scary death order physiology, but also a statement. Look how far we've come and how quickly. It worked. She became the immediate focus of attention when they stepped into the forum itself. Never mind the geodesic dome overhead with its angel's eye view of the earth. Never mind the charcoal concrete floor with the polished bronze forked spiral, a stylized representation of the galaxy embossed in the middle. Never mind the warm lighting and the panelling on the wall made from several kinds of wood imported from the homeworlds of the Celsi, Quins, Jagiran and Lathuk. Nor the imposing and venerable ambassadors from those species sitting at their desks. It was a beautiful chamber, as if the Quinnis would settle for an ugly one, and they'd invaded it looking decidedly ugly. She ran her best fists and Mai over the lot of them, relying on the faceless mirror black of her flight helmet to do all the communicating she needed. Only the Celsi ambassador failed to emote discomfort, but then again, Celsi were notorious for not backing down easily. The whole alliance was named after them for a reason. Ambassador Verma, the Jagiran ambassador stood. You alarm us with your sudden summons and your troops. They, Jagiran were monogendered and insisted on impersonal pronouns, waved an arm languidly at the marines. We request an explanation. The Global Representative Assembly has instructed me to inform you of a new development. Verma replied, having apparently decided not to bother with circumspection. You may not be aware of some security threats on Earth that we've been fighting, but that situation has now reached the point where we must ask both this embassy and that of the Dominion to relocate to the Simbrine system. The Lathuk ambassador was the first to speak. Lathuk defied easy description, being a bipedal biological eccentricity whose tiny beady black eyes gave them almost no vision to speak of, and who had neither a sense of smell nor much apparently in the way of a sense of taste. Their primary sense by a country ma was hearing, and in place of a head, they had two gargantuan ears mounted high and forward on their shoulders. Those ears and their spindly bird-like limbs always gave Riley the impression that they would go tumbling away in a strong breeze, as she had to chew down the racist impulse to think they looked absurd. They were actually an important partner in the Alliance, providing for most of the agriculture and a steady supply of warm bodies. Even if the war had been in a low ebb for the last 10 years, thanks in no small part to human intervention, the Alliance was still rattling every sabre they had, and they meant signing up young beings, among them plenty of Vathok, to serve on whatever new front line might open up if a lasting peace wasn't eventually worked out. You are picking a side? she asked. Ambassador Verma's job over the last four years had included exerting whatever gentle pressure humanity could muster to keep the war from boiling over again. The Celsi leadership might have been reckoned as master strategists, but Riley was pretty sure that any second lieutenant with Sun Tzu and Robert A. Highline on their bookshelf already had a more comprehensible strategic education than the most seasoned Celsi general officer. The war so far had been catastrophically bloody and industrial. But of course, the Dominion was too proud to let the rebels win by granting them whatever territory they'd already carved out, and the Alliance was too proud to settle for what they had. No. Verma's assertion was instant and firm. 
We remain committed to the neutrality and independence of our species. Then what are these troops for? The Celsius ambassador asked. And why are they wearing protective gear? The Quinnis ambassador added, taking the bait. That was Riley's cue. Our equipment is a precautionary measure. We hope it proves unnecessary, she hinted smoothly. ETs were notoriously gullible when on the back foot, and while outright liars were present in the diplomatic toolbox, in the years since Riley herself had summoned these two space stations into orbit around Earth, the most effective tool by far that humanity's diplomats have fallen back on time and again was criticism. Therefore, reputation did the rest. The ambassadors all glanced at one another, again insofar as she could tell, she wasn't even sure Celsi could turn their head, and after a few seconds, the Jagiran spoke again. What is the exact nature of this security concern? They asked. We're not at liberty to disclose that information for now, Firma replied. Please, there will be plenty of time later to discuss exactly why this is being done, but for now it's safest for the embassies to relocate to Simbrine. We shall need to discuss, the Celsi began, and Firma cut him off. Ambassadors. Please do not mistake this for a request, he said firmly. This relocation is a condition of continuing to have a relationship with the human race. Riley consciously didn't fidget during the long moment of deliberation that followed. There was a low but non-zero chance that if there was a hierarchy demon among the ambassadors, and if they had any last-ditch contingencies to try, this would be the moment. Werbs were lurking in the wings ready to obliterate the station the moment it lit a jump beacon. Knowing that by far the most destructive thing that humanity had ever built was aimed at the soles of Riley's feet was a test of composure to almost rival the infamous rubber chicken. Another benefit to the inscrutable visor. The ETs couldn't see her sweat. Very well, the Celsi grunted at last. He leaned over and spoke softly into a microphone on his desk. Riley breathed a sigh of relief and touched the push to talk button on the side of her helmet. Illuim, this is Helen. Paris has agreed to relocate, she announced softly. Copy that, Helen. Agamemnon is also relocating. Awesome, Riley breathed a sigh of relief. I'll prepare a slave jump. Understood. We'll send a runner to Simbreen for codes. Illuim, out. She turned to Verma. Okay, the jump's all set up. I need to get back to Phoenix to play cab driver. Go ahead, Firma invited. Thank you, Major. I think your presence helped tremendously. Don't thank me until we're safely around Simbrine 5, Riley replied. She certainly wouldn't be happy until the station was outside of the Simbrine system field, where no possible hierarchy action could threaten humanity through it, and where it no longer needed to have an FTR superweapon aimed at it. She turned and marched out with two of the Marines in tow, and put in the call to Semiser to fire the sled up. She leaned against the elevator wall as they headed back down to the hangar deck, and reflected that going from interspecies celebrity to messenger girl, to threatening muscle to glorified truck driver in one afternoon, was a pretty good summary of her career. She stretched and sighed. You boys been in space before? One of the marines chuckled under his hood. No, ma'am. Not exactly glamorous, is it? I dunno, the other one piped up. Maybe it's just worn off for you, ma'am. I was nerding out the whole time we were in there talking to them ETs. Riley had to laugh and nod agreement to that, smiling inside her helmet. Maybe, she agreed. Maybe it has. Date point. Tenth year. Fourth month. Third week. Third day. AV. Epley Airfield. Omaha. Nebraska, USA, Earth. Kevin Jenkins. But you're an exec. Aren't you a bit senior to be standing at the airport with a sign? Kevin shrugged. A pointless gesture in a phone call, but still a natural and unthinking one. These kids are important, he replied smoothly. And no offense, Walter, but I'm the only other abductee in the whole Byron group. They're going to need to hear what I've got to say. Walter Billings scoffed. That was why Kevin liked the man. He didn't guard his manners among the team. The team was a loose idea, 
and it consisted of everybody involved behind the scenes in bringing Byron Group Exploration Vessel 11 from conception to space. Walter and his lifelong colleague and best friend Jennifer McAllister, Clara Brown, Nee Erickson and her father Michael, the implacable Mr Williams, whose given name of Raymond was one of Kevin's most cherished secrets, the man himself hated it, Moses Byron and of course Kevin himself. Didn't Sue Chang break your nose? Williams wasn't happy to hear that. He's still grousing about loose cannon behaviour, you know. She'll be great. She was just having a hard time adjusting to Terran life again and I pressed the wrong buttons, Kevin replied. Trust me, Walter. I know these kids. I know what they've been through and I want to put a human face on what's going to happen to them. And if I can maybe give them some advice that'll help them get through whatever Keating and those other stone-faced assholes have planned? Protecting the bet you put on them, eh? You bet on them too, Walter. You're right. Advice away. Just tell me you're going to be back in the office sometime today because I urgently need to discuss the waste processor design with you. Gavin chuckled. Well, shit, how can I refuse an offer like that? He asked. I'll be right in after I drop them off at the box. I'll see you then. Bring popcorn. It was Kevin's turn to scoff, and Billings entered the call laughing. Kevin adjusted his collar. There wasn't a force on the planet Earth or any other world besides that would persuade him to wear a tie, and leaned on the railing again. Well aware that alongside the other people lodging against it with cars in their hands, he probably stood out in being by far the most well dressed. There was just something about a properly tailored expensive suit that left the slightly faded chauffeur's uniforms and short sleeve shirts or polos to either side of him, looking like they belonged in the background. As it happened, Chang, Bueller and Esther City had apparently listened to the group's request to not bring more than a few small personal effects, and hadn't burdened themselves with anything more than their carry-on luggage. They were the first ones to come out of arrivals, each one carrying a smallish bag and the clothes on their backs, and all dressed comfortably for travel. Kevin got their attention with a wave, pointed with a movement of his head and met them at the end of the rank with a round of handshakes. Figured I'd collect you in person, he said. All sorted out up in Minnesota? We packed it all up and fixed everything. The place should be okay without us for a couple of years, Julian replied. Good. Heck of a commitment you're making. It's what we want, Shu told him. When Kevin looked questioningly at her, she shrugged. You are right. Sorry. Didn't you two already apologise to each other? Alison asked. She jerked her head towards the airport's doors. Come on, if we're making a big commitment, let's commit. Julian and Ju both chuckled, hoisted their bags and followed her, chorusing, Yes, ma'am, like it was a private in-joke of theirs, which it probably was. Kevin jogged a few steps to catch up with her. Ain't gonna be easy, he warned. You're not the only team on the list. You're the favourites, but you've got competition. Have the others been out there before? Alison asked. That's why you're the favourites. They haven't. But they're no slouches. Veterans, doctors, top qualifications. They all have the right stuff. What's your point, Jenkins? Kevin stepped in front of her and stopped them all by raising his hands. My point is that the only person in the whole Byron group who actually cares about you guys getting this gig is me. No false manipulative bullshit this time, okay? I know what it's like. It took me fucking years to finally find a place for myself. Alison just gave him a get to the point stare while behind her, Zhu and Julian exchanged a glance. Look, he continued, the other would-be crews competing against you? They're fine. If they don't get the job, it'll be like whatever to them, right? They're not abductees. They don't fucking... they'll still fit, right? Now have any of you given serious thought to what's going to happen? Or how are you going to do if you don't earn this? They hadn't. He could read it in all three of their faces. But he waited for them all to look at each other, come to the same conclusion and return their attention to him. Then for the love of Elvis, please, please listen to me. And listen good, because I've only got the one chance to tell you this stuff. They relaxed, nodded and listened. Date point. 10th year. 4th month. 3rd week. 3rd day, AV. 
Folkfa, Simbreen, The Far Reaches, Gabriel Ares. Gabriel loved his job, but it came with a price of having precious little in the way of spare time. Simbreen Colonial Security was a tight ship, full of some of the most dedicated, highly trained and passionate police officers he'd ever had the pleasure of working with, who were policing what was largely an educated, professional and successful population. On the policing front, usually the worst he had to deal with were Gowians. Gowian males fought constantly. In their culture, for two males to clash and walk away with permanent disfiguring scars was not only commonplace, it was practically necessary. It was a rare male who could catch the eyes of folk for a small population of sisters without some impressive dueling scars. By human standards, of course, the fights were aggravated assault, shading to outright attempted murder in some of the nastier cases. Nobody knew better than CCS that Gallians were emphatically not cute and fluffy space raccoons. They were an alien species with alien morality, and sometimes that alien morality got blood on the walls. Then there was liaising with the military. Simbreen was in many ways ugly better protected than Earth, thanks to its status as the permanent home of the Saw and of the Allied space fleet. Sure, that space fleet was exclusively British for the time being, but with the USS San Diego and its sisters in the works, that was due to change, and Gabriel knew from discussions with Admiral Knight that they were trying hard to get their hands on a Dominion-built orbital shipyard to give the ships a permanent anchorage. Then there was the Saw. Gabriel really didn't know how he felt about the Saw. Having a cadre of unnervingly big and strong almost super soldiers stomping around the town, putting every gym rat on both Simbreen and Earth to shame, and between them accounting for an impressive percentage of Folkfa's family planning spending, well, that was almost as disconcerting as the fact that his only son was one of them. The Air Force had been one thing. Watching Adam spend his 16th year growing from wiry teen to a fit youth had been proud. Watching that fit youth become a dense, powerful airman had lifted Gabriel's soul. Watching that dense and powerful airman gain in endurance and strength as he went through pararescue training, had impressed on him just how strong the boy really was. Or so he thought. The Saw had redefined those limits, converting a merely exceptionally fit and strong young man into a titan, something straight out of Greek legend, or perhaps the more comic book kind of barbarian hero. That hadn't lifted Gabriel's soul at all. Quite the opposite. It had impressed on him just how broken the boy really was. Not that he could blame him. It was with a sense of trepidation, therefore, that he'd agreed to a movie night with Adam and John at Adam's penthouse apartment on Dementor Road. If there was one thing he'd definitely say for the USAF, it was financially generous to the men who sacrificed for it. Every man in the saw had come to St. Bream with a pocket full of homesteading money, and, thanks to the regimented and tightly controlled nature of their lifestyles, which necessitated that the regiment pay for almost everything, precious little in the way of living expenses. Even with Folkfa's relatively steep taxes, Gabriel suspected that Adam had tens of thousands in spending money and savings that he didn't know what to do with. And a little thing like inviting his old man to visit on the rare occasion when their days off overlapped wouldn't be setting him back by much either. If only the gigantic brat had bothered to remember that Gabriel was nursing a years old femoral nerve injury that may steps a literal pain in the ass. There was no elevator in the building that Adam co-owned with Wilson Akiyama. Just eight flights of stairs, and it took Gabe 20 minutes to climb them. He leaned heavily on his cane at the top to recover, reflecting that despite his best efforts at fitness and rehabilitation, his mobility was never coming back. Finally, he knocked on the door. Adam opened it in seconds, and smothered Gabe in an enormous muscular hug. Hey, es es bien. Le gustad. Subir estas estadas de mierda, Gabriel replied pointedly, nodding back at the obstacle that had held him up. Adam looked at them, then at his stick, and the penny made a solid wooden thunk as it finally dropped. Ah, shit. Cabe chuckled and reached out to affectionately ruffle what little hair Adam had kept. Es un cabello de guerra, un umbrero de guerra, 
he joked. Adam chuckled and welcomed him inside. The apartment was definitely a well-off bachelor's party pad. It was furnished with style and elegance, and was comfortable enough, but didn't look like it was regularly lived in. Despite the best efforts of the hired cleaners, the place had a permanent after-party olfactory background, or booze, B.O. and sex. No cannabis, though. Even though it was just as legal as alcohol in folk fur, the soul were forbidden from touching the stuff. The Spanish had to come to an end when John leaned around the dividing wall between the lounge and the kitchen. Hey, Mr. Ares. Hello, John. What's cooking? Jerky. Gonna need another hour, but this is my grandpa's recipe. Best you'll ever taste, trust me. Gay glanced at Adam, who nodded with a grin. It is, he confirmed. Bueno. What are we watching? Good question, Adam said. Base? John had gone still. Slowly, he turned and gave them an embarrassed, brittle smile. A movie that I uh, forgot to bring with me. Top marks? Well done, damas. Adam applauded sarcastically. John cleared his throat and named his thumb at the door. I'll go get it. It's on base. That's three miles away, Gabriel pointed out. Yeah, I'll be back in half an hour. Peace. John took off down the stairs, springing down them two at a time. He is going to run the whole way there and back in half an hour? Gabriel asked. No big deal, Adam shrugged. So, hey, just you and me for half an hour. Beer? Sounds good. Gabe sank gratefully onto the couch, a manoeuvre that really demonstrated just how much he needed his cane, and sat back, happy to finally have the weight of his bad leg. It was no ordinary couch. When Adam slammed down into it a few seconds later with a couple of open beers, it barely seemed to register him, despite his incredible mass. He kicked his feet up onto the coffee table, and gestured at the TV to turn it on, an innovation that has slowly started to replace the old-fashioned remote control. Relocation of the embassies has already met with vocal criticism from the Dominion, and while the Royal Navy continues to lend support in the humanitarian crisis on perfection, Dominion officials are now blaming the attack on human military action in that system, claiming that there was some kind of battle. While the Ministry of Defence, the Pentagon and Scotch Creek all declined to comment, sources at Hephaestus LRC have confirmed that HMS Caledonia is now in dry dock at the Ceres shipyard undergoing emergency repairs and in Manchester, England, the family of Petty Officer Thomas Kendrick, who served aboard Caledonia, have released a statement asking for privacy. Not that they're going to fucking get it, Adam grumbled. That's not the media's job, Gabe agreed. You know what happened? Marty told me. The ship caught fire. Marty? Shit, haven't I told you about Marty? Adam turned on the couch, shedding grimness and disgust with the media like a summer coat. No? Oh, man. Marty's just the fucking best. Makes me look dumb as a bag of rocks. Funny, sexy as all hell. Gabriel threw up his hands to interrupt the boy, feeling completely knocked off balance. Whoa, whoa, amigo. Seriously? Yeah, I've even thought of a great venue for a first date and... Wow. Gabriel blinked at his only son and assembled his thoughts. Okay, that's some big news. Adam blinked at him. What? Man, I just... I mean, I never would have guessed. I mean, I love you anyway, amigo, but you really could have broken the news more gently. Martina, Dad! Her name's Martina. Oh! Gabe relaxed and laughed at the ceiling, wiping her forehead. He was too relieved to feel embarrassed. Gracias a Dios! Adam's enormous shoulders rocked as he wheezed out his best muttly laugh, and it gave Gabe a huge crushing hug. Nah, nah, nah. You've got nothing to worry about there, I promise. Good, because I had a vision of a world without grandkids and I didn't like it, Gabe chuckled. Well, I mean, we're not even dating yet. Adam cleared his throat. So you're going to have to wait a bit, yeah? Hmm. Are you sure you're ready to date her? It's kind of early, amigo. What's it been? Three months? Less than? 
Adam turned the TV down as the news turned his attention to the sport. She's not like Ava. She saw, she knows the deal. That's the opposite of encouraging. You think so? Gabe nodded to himself, at once glad and slightly disappointed to learn that the side of beef sat next to him was definitely still the same Adam. Adam, maybe this martini would understand the why of it a bit better, sure, but apart from that bit at the end, there, where she ran out of hope and did something stupid, Ava was as patient with you as any girl could be. Marty might be more understanding, but that's not a license for you to just do your thing and treat her as something you do in your spare time. I wouldn't... You already did, Gabe pointed out. And you just called off a long-term relationship less than three months ago. You sure you're not just thinking with that big warhorse worker of yours? Dad! What? I know how you got your nickname, man. Hell, you've been saluting the dawn since you were twelve. Good for you. You take after your old man. I really didn't need to know that. Gabe chuckled. Hey, it's just my right leg that doesn't work properly, he winked. Judging that the boy was suitably embarrassed, he relented, but it's not for thinking with, amigo. Are you really after another committed relationship right now, or do you just want to smash? Adam looked away. I... Shit. Dad, now you've got to be second-guessing, he complained. Good. You should second-guess. I second-guess all the time. Gabriel patted him on his huge and stunningly hard shoulder. It's a good way to avoid hurting the people you really care for. Adam nodded and said nothing for a minute or so. I guess I do want an actual relationship, he said. But I don't know. Am I ready for one? You're right, I fucked up the last one pretty bad. Marty's special, Dad. I don't want to hurt her like I did Eva. Gabe nodded sympathetically. Then my advice is don't go for it until you've got more experience, he suggested. Have fun with some other girls you don't care about so much first. Break a few hearts so you learn how not to break hers. After all, nobody climbed Everest for their first mountain, did they? I guess, but are you sure? If she's that special to you, you need to know how to do it right. And right now you don't, Gabe told him. No, I'm not sure, and I don't think it'd be the right advice for everyone. But I think it's the right advice for you, here and now. I'll think about it. Adam rumbled awkwardly. Good. I don't want you to just blindly follow advice just because I gave it. You've got a damn good brain, amigo. I want to see you using it, okay? Adam hugged him. Love you, Dad. Love you too, Gabe promised, feeling his upper back creak and pop. Maybe show your love by getting this crippled old man another beer. Yeah, yeah, Adam laughed, and launched himself easily to his feet before picking his way toward the fridge, in that curiously agile and quiet way of his that blowed how heavy he was. Don't overplay that disability card, though. Gabriel chuckled and settled into the couch, looking forward to a long and comfortable evening. I'm sure my soul will survive a small abuse of power, he said. Date point. Tenth year, fourth month, third week, third day, A.V. Finchley, London. UK. Earth. Simon Harvey. Simon had always, in a faintly racist and absentmindedly English way, thought of Spanish as a beautiful and romantic language, evoking imagery of holiday sun, balls, tomatoes and siestas. Eva Rios, however, could spit it like a dragon breath, a potent blend of fire and venom that sneered at the need for translation. You didn't need to know what the words meant to know what they meant. Though, frankly, her skill at English profanity was no less impressive, and Sean could match her blow for verbal blow. A door slammed. A rumbling, angry pause later, she stomped down the stairs in her boots and a thundercloud of quiet vulgarities. She didn't see Simon at all as she stormed into the kitchen and yanked the fridge open, angrily rattling several blameless bottles and upsetting the broccoli. She stared wildly into it for a few seconds, then shut the door, leaned against it heavily, and was suddenly crying instead. He couldn't blame her for being mad. When Sean and he had returned from Egypt, they still damn near being leaking sand on the doormat when Sean had launched into interrogating her about what exactly had happened since they parted ways at the embassy in Cairo. 
This had irritated and upset her, but she kept her cool and patiently explained that she was bound by the kind of non-disclosure agreement that no sane or self-interested person would be inclined to break. Sean had pushed, and Simon had carefully retreated into the kitchen, so as to remove himself from the vicinity of the escalating row. Ava had testily informed Sean that unless he was volunteering to take her place on death row, he could forget it. Sean had dismissed the possibility that either of them would end up there, and had gone so far as to hint that she was just trying to get back in the Saw's good books. Ava had, rather irately, informed him that that ship was long sailed and that she probably couldn't get back in those gentlemen's good books if she had a hundred years to work on it. The first minor swear word had lurked unnoticed in the middle of her explanation. Simon had made himself a cup of tea. Sean's kettle was quite a loud one, which had mercifully obscured the conversation, but its sense of dramatic timing was impeccable, because it had clicked off perfectly, in time for him to hear, Fine, keep lying. It's what you're best at. Simon had hung his head and groaned as the dragon fire started flying. He could hardly blame her either. In fact, while the argument had swirled around the whole house, he had drunk his tea and quietly resolved to give his idiot nephew a ringing clout upside the head when he got the chance. He cleared his throat. She flinched, turned around and wiped her face, fighting back some control. Shit, Simon, I'm sorry. I forgot you were there. Are you okay? Ava sighed, shook her head, then changed her mind, shrugged and nodded. I've had worse fights. Simon nodded by way of accepting the answer. If you don't mind my asking. No, sure. She opened the fridge again and got out the filter jug full of cold water. Sean's always been a bit of a fucking wanker sometimes, but I've never known him be that, well, that nasty before. What happened with you two? Ava sat down. I used him to cheat on my boyfriend, she said stating it so bluntly and mercilessly that Simon was put in mind of a flagellant scaring their own back. Oh, Ava, you bloody idiot, Simon groaned, not unkindly. Yeah, biggest mistake of my life. She poured herself a drink and sipped it. If I can ask, and you're living with him, despite that, I... Ava glanced toward the door as if Sean might have magically stealthed down the stairs without either of them detecting even the faintest whisper. Simon, I make, like, just enough money to pay my rent and my half of the bills here, and that's only because he's renting the room for me for way, way less than it's worth. I've got no savings, no spare money to save up. If I could afford it, I'd get the fuck out of here right now, but I can't. Couldn't you move back to Simbreen? I hear the living is cheap there. Not cheap enough. Can't your family help? Your dad's the head of Simbrine Colonial Security, isn't he? I'm not going to beg off dad. I'm set up here. I'm getting by. I won't burn them with any more of my shit. He interrupted her. How much would you need? Well, Simon, are you offering me money? How much? He repeated. I can't take your money. Just answer the question, Ava. She exhaled irritably and thought about it. It depends. Uh... If I rent out there, I guess a couple of thousand to tie me over and get set up. Simon nodded and fished his phone out of his pocket. Uh, no, Simon. Ava, listen to me. Simon set his phone down. I have a house in Islington. Not a flat, a house. You know what the property prices are like in this city, so you know I can afford to loan you a couple of thousand. But you belly, it's my money and I'll do whatever the hell I like with it. Thank you very much. But... Why? Because I've got two very talented young journalists on my hands who won't be able to work together. He raised a hand to intercept her interruption. Don't bullshit me. Your professional relationship with Sean is built on drama and fuck all else, and arguments like that. If I don't separate you two, something's going to happen that ruins both your reputations, and by extension your careers. This is the best fix. You're sure? You don't deserve to suffer for him being a complete tit. And he doesn't deserve to suffer for you not having your shit sorted out. Simon put it bluntly. She showed no sign of taking offence. He picked up the phone again. 
I'll put in a call to a mate of mine. He said something about somebody starting up a news channel in Fogfur. A pretty local girl like you could be making big money in front of the camera rather than behind it. So you'll be able to pay me back soon enough. Throw in 10% if you feel you have to. Feed me leads. However you want to repay me. However your conscience tells you to. But for God's sake, don't be stupid enough to try and tough it out with Sean. He wasn't quite sure why, but that last warning seemed to score a hit. Ava looked down and away, chewed on her lip and frowned. Simon, thank you, really, but I don't think... Ava? She stopped babbling her protests, blinked at him, then licked her lips and tried again, rather more calmly. I want to earn my way, Simon, she said. I don't want charity. This isn't charity, Simon said. It's an investment and it's career advice from the old guard to the new kid. And I believe it's a damn safe investment too. If I put in a good word for you, it will carry weight. And that's not charity either. You earned that good word. She swallowed and looked at his phone with her resolve obviously wavering. So Simon gave her one last push. Go home, he said. Date point. Tenth year, fourth month, third week, third day, AV. Omaha, Nebraska, USA, Earth. Alison Bueller. This is it? Kevin cranked the parking brake and nodded. This is the box, he confirmed. Good name, she remarked, while giving the box a wide-eyed, cautious look. Alison evaluated it herself with a slightly more guarded expression. When the group had talked about accommodations throughout the training period, she had imagined a decent-sized house. Nothing elaborate, just a couple of bedrooms, a bathroom. Not a box. That really was all it was. A featureless half-cube squatting smack in the middle of a fenced and tree-lined Byron Group compound, like a particularly obtuse art installation, and surrounded by three wings of a more building-like building. There was all huge glass windows and warm brown wood. Jenkins ID had seen them pass the security at the gate without issue, and he parked up a short distance from the welcome party, who emerged from the larger building. So yeah, the box is a mock-up of the interior of the ship you'll be flying. Idea is you guys are going to have to get used to it, so you may as well do that here on Earth, so you can back out if you have to. Don't want your going stir crazy three months into a two-year mission. Looks snug, Julian suggested taking refuge in understatement. Trust me, it's even smaller on the inside. Jenkins glanced apologetically at him in the rearview mirror. Anyway, the rest of this is the training facility and mission support. All the people working in this building are here to do one of two things. Teach you the skills you need to do this, or make sure you've got the chops for it. Odds are you won't ever even meet half of them, but they'll know you better than you know yourselves, and fast too. So this is it then. Zhu fidgeted with her bag. This is where you'll leave us. Yup. Remember, like I said, these guys are going to try and fail you. You can't bullshit them, so don't even try. They ask you a question, best thing is to answer it honestly and directly. They can't order you around, but it'd be a damn good idea to follow their instructions anyway. Don't suck up to them. They ain't after brown noses. But just be honest. And be yourselves. Thanks. Julian reached forward and Kevin twisted in his seat to shake hands over his shoulder. Alison and finally Zhu followed suit and then, there being no reason to delay the future anymore, they got out of the car. Jenkins drove away as soon as the doors were all closed. There was an awkward moment of wary sizing up and then an aging man in a blue polo shirt stepped forward. It's nice to finally meet you guys, he said. Dr. Michael Erickson, I am the team leader for BGEV-11. They made their introductions. Erickson scored points by making sure he got the pronunciation of Zhu's name down properly, before introducing them to the rest of his team, including his daughter and several other colleagues. The list of names was bewildering. Don't worry, Erickson said reassuringly, once the last introductions were made. We'll be working together for the next six months, you'll have plenty of time to get to know us. Alison looked at Julian and Jew. They were standing close to each other and gave her an identical, slightly wide-eyed look that said, lead on. 
so she must have more determination than she really felt now that they were really here, really doing this, and nodded firmly. I guess we should dive in then, she said. Excellent, Erickson beamed. He stepped aside, and a man who hadn't yet been introduced to them stepped forward. Allison tried not to take an immediate disliking to the newcomer. He had the stern expression of somebody who was evaluating her, and rating her only slightly above something he stepped in. Mr. Keating here will introduce you to your living space and carry out your first assessment. There was a round of handshakes and promises of looking forward to working with and see you on, and the BGEV-11 team drifted away, leaving Allison, Julian and Zhu alone with Keating. He didn't ingratiate himself at all with his brusque attitude. Here's how it is, he began without preamble. The three of you have signed up for spending several months in training together, followed by two years in the ship together, and the ship is small. Your notions of privacy and personal space are going to have to change drastically and quickly. You are literally going to be living on top of each other, with precious few opportunities to escape, and that's going to mean you'll either be the very best of companions, or you're going to end up hating each other. In which case, you won't make the grade and will be flying on that ship. You are making a commitment to long-term physical and emotional intimacy. I... Oh. Alison looked down. Zhu had taken a hand, and Julian's too, and was giving Keating a level, please get on with it expression. There was a freeway round of eye contact among them, and Keating visibly cut out part of his script. Good, he said, but save the decision for after you've seen what you'll be living in. He led them round to what was unmistakably an airlock. The box is supposed to be a close copy of what the final interior of BGEV-11 will look like. This is a quadruple seal lock, plenty of redundancy. Nevertheless, good entry and exit practice will be a necessary part of your drill. Every time you leave or enter the box, you'll go through the procedure I'm about to show you. Failing to do so will be a black mark against you. Do you understand? They nodded, and Keating entered the code. Tomorrow, you'll each be setting your own code, he said, and we'll be explaining the safety rationale behind that in your first mission briefing. For now, all you need to know is that it's vital not to share your codes. They help us track your comings and goings, and also serve an important security function. Now, he continued, stepping through the outer locked doors as they opened. The first step is sealing and decontamination. Come on. They squeezed into the lock alongside him. It was actually surprisingly spacious. Allison could have wheeled a couple of motorcycles for it side by side. Don't stand in the yellow spaces, Keating instructed. The doors behind you will close. They did so. And you should select your decontamination cycle. The doors in front won't open until you've decontaminated, unless you throw the emergency override, which is only to be used if you're abandoning ship, or if you're returning to the ship with a life-threatening injury. He gestured to a touchscreen, with green, yellow and red icons on it. Green is basic, just a filter field. Coupled with your frontline implants, it should suffice in almost every case. Yellow is for when you've been exposed to radioactive or chemical contaminants. If you select that one, you'll need to remove and discard your clothing into the chute. Zhu wanted to ask a question, Alison knew, but held her peace. Keating either didn't notice or didn't care. Red? He finished. It's the works, and it's for use in cases where you think you've been contaminated with some kind of deadly agent that could spell doom for the whole species if it got back to Earth. In this case, you'll need to strip and shower, shave off all your hair. You'll be powdered and biofielded, and kept in quarantine for a minimum of 48 hours. When in doubt, use the highest setting. Hair grows back, but death is forever. Alison felt you huddle in a little closer to her. She knew Zhu was a bit vain about her hair, which meant that the prospect of having to shave it all off. She surreptitiously put a reassuring arm around Zhu's waist, as Keating selected the green option, and the familiar yellow shimmer of a biofilter force field swept across them, completely with that uncomfortable too clean feeling that left Allison itching and having to resist the urge to run her tongue over teeth that suddenly felt unnaturally smooth and sterile. This is all simulated, right? Julian asked. Accurately. Keating seemed to be determined to intimidate and scare them. 
he introduced them to the excursion room that lay beyond the airlock. Basically a glorified experiment closet with an armory bench and lockers, taking up every square inch of wall, floor and ceiling. To their left as they entered was a door marked Pilot, and opposite the airlock was another door marked Lab. Keating said nothing more about them, than that they'd have the chance to become familiar with their workstations in due course. He indicated to the right, pointing out the door at the end that led into engineering. Assorted access hatches marked waste processing and atmosphere, and the two doors marked pantry and habitation. Everything he indicated was a safety or failsafe. Everything he told them about procedure was a dire warning. It was obviously calculated to rattle them, and Allison treated the attempt with the contempt it deserved. They weren't children. All three of them had literally almost died of vacuum exposure. Being lectured unnecessarily on safety by a pictured little man who probably had never gotten further than 30,000 feet from Earth's surface was just... She reined in her mounting indignation. Kevin's advice on that score had been solid and worth listening to. Everything they do will be a test, he said. If they're irritating the fuck out of you, for fuck's sake keep a lid on it, because they're testing your composure. So she took a cleansing breath when she judged that Keating wasn't looking, and caught Julian's eye. Composed and laid back as he was, Julian looked like he was struggling to maintain his calm as well, but he was sharper than his hatchet when it came to picking up on Allison's mood nowadays, and they reaffirmed one another's corners. Zhu was less readable. She'd gone pale and quiet, but also attentive. Of the three of them, she seemed the least irritated, and the most nervous. Keating ignored their exchange, if he detected it. Instead, he finally opened the door marked Habitation. And this is your living space, he announced. Allison bit down hard on the urge to vent sarcastically. The room was barely as big as a boxing ring at most and four people standing in the middle did a fine job of making it feel crowded. She had to admire the effort that had gone into using such a tiny volume effectively, though. As she looked around, she realised that everything was recessed into, or folded away to become part of, the walls and ceiling. So long as it was kept tidy and uncluttered, it would definitely provide every need they could have, including some shelf space for luxuries and personal items. Forward wall, kitchen and storage. Keating indicated it. You've got a range, a microwave, the Vossa can give you boiling water, and if you need more counter space... He hauled on part of the countertop, which unfolded, tripling the amount of work surface. Half all is fitness and leisure. There's a treadmill, weights, everything you need to keep yourselves in shape, plus the couch, TV, bookshelf, port wall... He slapped the one beside the door they just come through. Is your wardrobe, laundry, more storage? Finally, the starboard wall. He indicated it. There were three bunks recessed into it, along with a door of some kind and a towel rack. In the actual ship, those bunks will double as emergency pressurised environments, and if need be, as escape pods. They'll pull 20 kilolites. Not fast, but quicker than the Dominion Standard. That door to the right is your bathroom. Toilet, sink and shower all in one. Take a look. Julian glanced at the girls, then did so, sliding the door aside. Uh, I've had cell phones bigger than this thing, he commented. Are you complaining? Keating asked. No, not really. I mean, it makes sense. Julian closed the door again. It's just kind of settling in how big of a change we're in for. Zhu raised a hand. Um? Keating gave her an expectant look. Yes, Miss Chang? If the wardrobe's over there, and that whole thing is the shower, I mean, where do we get changed? I did say that the three of you will need to become very used to physical proximity and a lack of privacy, Keating told her. Ellison couldn't resist an irritated tick of the eyebrow at his perfunctionary tone. How you sorted out is your problem. My advice is to just suck it up and get naked. Privacy and modesty are first world luxuries that people went without for millennia. And you'll do just fine once you've adjusted to their absence. If you can't, you have no business being here. Blushing furiously, 
She went quiet. Are there any more questions? Keating asked. There were several rhetorical ones that Alison judged it would be unwise to ask, and Julian was too busy sharing his own version of Hugh's blush. Keating relaxed a little. The engineering team are still building the ship, he said. If you really need or want them, they can try and build in some reasonable extras and customizations. The box, however, is not being modified. And the reason for that is that the three of you really will need to be the tightest team. This is deliberately difficult for your own good. And you wouldn't be here if we thought you couldn't handle it. We understand that, Alison told him. Good. Then I have just one quick round of assessment to make before I leave you to settle in. Keating turned to Zhu and handed her a piece of paper. Miss Chang, could you please read this aloud? Xu took it, blinked at it, then cleared her throat, blush fading as she was given something else to focus on. Um, the Great Pyramid of Giza was constructed about 4,600 years ago by King Khufu of the Fourth Dynasty. It includes tomb chambers for the king and for his wife. Um, that's all. Thank you, Keating said. Could you say that in Gowry? Zhu rubbed at her neck. Not easily, she confessed. Why not? Well, for great, I could use she, meaning very large, or yue, meaning very good. I don't know the Gary word for pyramid. In Gary you would say 4,600, like 4,600. And the word for hundred has that awkward yipping sound in it that I can't pronounce properly. And I don't know if Gary has words for dynasty and tomb. And I know it doesn't have words for king or wife. Give me your best approximation. Keating pressed. Um, she giza nes ye pyramid nes, sha ye au e kip. Sorry, that's that yipping sound I can't do. Ayo kip, yimi kip. Simi ma ye, sa kofu nes, yimi yimi denisi nes. She, no, that's not right. Cho yo maiwa tum nes ye, um, yibe sao o bueno, bueno. She gave up. Sorry, his wife just doesn't translate at all. Not even his mate for life or something like that? Keating suggested. Zhu shook her head. Why not? Gaurians wouldn't say his mate. They would say, um... Zhu scowled in concentration. It's more like the mate he was with. Their language just doesn't let you possess a person. It'd be like if I said I had some not very for breakfast. See? That's okay. Keating made a note. Yimmy, Simmy. Im, Immy, Yim, Yimmy, Sim, Simmy, Jim, Jimmy, U, Ow, Im. Zhu recited, counting on her fingers. Then, Ow, Im, Um. Ow, Im, Immy. You got the idea. Keating nodded and turned to Julian. Mr. Essa how reliable is your prosthetic? It's temperamental, Julian conceded. When Keating waiting patiently, he elaborated. The first metatarsal isn't as strong as the real thing. And of course it doesn't heal, so once it breaks, I just have to glue it. Could you replace it with something stronger? Sure, but the weight would be off, Julian said. This feels exactly like a natural foot, you see. If the foot was heavier, I'd have to learn how to walk properly on it again. If we could rehabilitate you on a slightly heavier foot, would you be willing to? Julian shrugged. The only reason I didn't in the first place was because I needed to be up and at him right away, he said. Good. Keating made a note. Miss Bueller, when you filled in the paperwork, your education history was somewhat... bare. That's right, Alison nodded. No high school? I never graduated high school. Why not? Keating pried. Alison shook her head. That's ancient history. And it's nobody's business but mine, she declared. Bullshit. I'm here to assess you, Keating retorted. That means if I ask you a question, it is my business. And if you won't answer, then your contract is null and void. The three of you can go back to Minnesota and take your chances without the group's lawyers. All three of them stared at him, like he personally reached out and slapped her in the face. He just poised his pen and waited. You can't be serious, Allison asked. I'm completely serious. Keating's expression was stony. You are asking the group to entrust you with a multi-billion dollar spaceship. Now, 
I'll ask you again for the last time. Why didn't you finish high school? A large part of Alison wanted to believe he was playing chicken with her. Or maybe some other kind of stupid dominance mind game thing. Keating seemed to be the kind of guy who liked putting people in their place. And despite Kevin's excellent advice, just for a second she was tempted to show him her middle finger and her back in that order. Then she glanced at Julian and Ju, wavered and gave up. I got pregnant, she said, and couldn't stop herself from deflating completely. I had a baby. In high school? Keating asked. The worst part wasn't his interrogation. The worst part was the stunned expressions that Ju and Julian were wearing. Yes, Alison nodded. Suddenly ashamed, she rubbed her face, stared at her feet and tried to find her composure. Too young. And the father? He was too young too. His name, Keating clarified. Taylor, um, Taylor. Tyler Hamlin. And where is the child now? I don't know, Alison swallowed. My parents, they weren't nice about it. So I had my son. I put him up for adoption, and then as soon as I was old enough, I got the hell out of Salt Lake City. I've never tried to find him. Julian, God bless him, put his arm around her and aimed an arctic stare at Keating that instructed the man to drop it immediately. Meanwhile, if looks could have killed, the glare Zhu was producing should have blasted Keating's scorched flesh from his bones. Keating gave no sign of caring. Thank you, he said. I'll let you get settled in. He was halfway to the door when Alison angrily wrenched her dignity and confidence back into place. Hey, asshole! Keating paused. Yes? You gonna count that against me? No, Miss Bueller, I am not. Keating turned back to face her. I am, however, going to count your lack of self-control in calling me an asshole against you. Alison opened her mouth to protest and Keating cut her off. Listen, he said, sounding more bored and terse than angry. We are looking for any excuse we can find to dish the three of you. Do not give us one. Do you understand? Julian squeezed her hand and Alison fought back the urge to tear a strip off the man's hide. Instead, she swallowed her bruised pride and nodded. I understand. Keating nodded. Goodbye, he said. We won't meet again. The door made a solidly mechanical noise behind him. Jesus, Julian breathed. Then, with a note of concern, Al? Alison realised that she was shaking. I, uh, need to sit down? She suggested. I think, yeah, here. She gripped something in the wall and pulled. Alice on a couch. Alison sank onto it gratefully and took a few cleansing breaths. It helped. She only needed a few seconds to find her balance again. You guys okay? She asked. I'm fine, Julian promised, squatting in front of her. Zhu? Zhu nodded and sat next to Alison, giving her something that was halfway between a comforting back rub and a Gaoyan's concern pouring. Alison sighed and gave her a hug. I'm sorry I didn't tell you, she said. Al, we're fine, Julian promised. It doesn't change anything. You're sure? You don't mind I kept it secret? It explains a few things, Julian observed. But yeah, you never lied, you just told me you didn't want to talk about it. That's fine by me. Am I right? He asked you. Absolutely, she agreed. Alison sighed and relaxed. Thank you, she told them both. Zhu smiled for her. You're definitely a sister, she said. Thanks? Alison asked. I mean, you're... Um, I mean this as a compliment, but I really can't see you raising a child, Zhu explained, a touch clumsily. At least not yet. Um... Sorry. Julian chuckled. True. Wouldn't have it any other way either. Alison managed a weak smile, which faltered when she looked down at her hands and found they were threatening to become inextricably knotted together. I don't regret giving him away, she said. I couldn't take care of him. I'd have been a shitty mum. But they didn't even let me hold him. Said it wasn't good for us to bond. Sometimes, sometimes I think it would have been nice, though. 
just for a few minutes. You've never... Ju asked. I'm not his mummy. Alison shook her head, and scrubbed away the wetness around her eyes. If he comes looking for me someday, maybe. But I really hope he grows up so happy he never wants to. Julian gave her an enormous squeeze. Al, he'd be so excited and proud of you, I just know it. She returned the squeeze, but shook her head. Not yet he wouldn't, she disagreed. All I did was get abducted. She sniffed and straightened. But we're here now, doing this. So let's knock it out of the park. <laughs>